Today, we hear the cross-examination in court of Lucy Letby. Mr Johnson says Letby was a mentor to students. Letby gives details of what that would involve. Mr Johnson asks for paperwork. What would their responsibilities be? If one of them was given a handover sheet, what would they do with it? Letby says they would dispose of it, although student nurses would not have handover sheets in the first place. Mr Johnson asks why Letby kept bringing handover sheets home. Letby said it was a few. Mr Johnson responds, well, 250 times it isn't. Letby replies, well, that is over many years. Mr Johnson responds, well, even if it's 50, that's over five years. What is your normal practice? Letby replies, with the handover sheets, to dispose of them. They have come home with me. Mr Johnson replies, you have taken them home. Letby responds, not with the intent of keeping them. Mr Johnson says what would Letby's responsibilities be with sensitive data such as handover sheets? Letby replies, to keep it confidential. Mr Johnson asks what would the hospital do in disciplinary terms if they found Letby had 250 handover sheets at her home? Letby replies, I don't know the full details. They were at my home address, but they were held in confidence. In a bag in your garage? Letby replies, I was the only one in the house. Johnson responds, and the ones in your parents' house? Letby says the parents would not have access to the box in what would have been her bedroom. Mr Johnson replies, do you obey the rules when it suits you? Letby responds, no. Mr Johnson asks if handover sheets were handed out to student nurses. Letby said she would have handover sheets as a student nurse at some placements, but in the neonatal unit she cannot recall specifically. She tells the court it was not standard practice at the neonatal unit to hand out handover sheets to student nurses. Mr Johnson says one of the handover sheets, dated the 1st of June 2010, was in a keepsake box with roses on it. Letby says she cannot recall it. Mr Johnson asks what is unusual about the handover sheet and how it differs from the others. Letby is unsure what Mr Johnson means. Mr Johnson replies... It is in pristine condition. Letby responds, it's the original. Mr Johnson replies, yes. Mr Johnson says Letby took the sheet for June 23rd, 2016 home as it had notes of drugs for child O and child P. Letby said there was documentation on there but cannot be sure what details were on it. Letby said she took the note home deliberately to bring it back the following day for finishing up writing of medications. A copy of the handover sheet is circulated to the jury and let be. Mr Johnson says he is interested in the back on the medical notes. Let be describes what is on the note. Medication for child P, caffeine. Nothing was written for child O. No medications were noted for a third child. Let be said she had taken it back with the paper towel, which had further details. Let be is asked when the Morrison's work bag was placed under her bed. Letby says she cannot recall. The Ibiza bag became her new bag after her trip to Ibiza around June 2016. Letby is asked how the handover sheets ended up in her bag. She says after emptying her pockets, the sheets would end up in her work bag. Nicholas Johnson. You're ferrying work sheets to and from work. Letby. I can't say definitively. Nicholas Johnson. They must have been. Why put them in that bag at all? Let be. I, I can't recall. Nicholas Johnson. Can't or won't. Lucy Letby. They were just bits of paper to me. Letby says she accepts pieces of paper were taken between different areas and properties. Quote, it's the paper I accumulate, not the content. Letby says she has difficulty throwing things away. Nicholas Johnson. Is that why you bought a shredder? Lucy Letby replies. I bought a shredder for certain documents when I bought the house, predominantly bank statements. Nicholas Johnson. Why not the handover sheets? Lucy Letby. I wasn't aware I had them. I wasn't thinking. They were just bits of paper. Mr Johnson says the shredder was bought after Letby moved into her Chester home in April 2016. Lucy Letby replies, they were insignificant. Nicholas Johnson. They are significant. 
They have the names of dead children on them. Lucy Letby. They have the names of lots of children on them. I agree. I shouldn't have taken them home. Mr Johnson asks about other work documents found in Letby's Morrison's work bag, such as a blood gas record for child M. Nicholas Johnson. Were they insignificant? Letby says at the time the documents were insignificant as they went home along with a lot of other documents for babies not on the indictment. Lucy Letby. These have come home with me, not with any intention. Nicholas Johnson. You have taken them home. Letby accepts the wording. Mr Johnson asks if Letby recalls a colleague nurse's evidence for child M on the blood gas reading. Mr Johnson says she took it, wrote it on the chart and disposed of it. Letby is asked how she got the sheet, if it had been put in the hospital's confidential waste bin. Lucy Letby. I can't recall specifically. Nicholas Johnson. It was for your little collection, wasn't it? Lucy Letby. No. Mr Johnson asks why Letby purchased a shredder if she wasn't going to use it. Was she on so much money she could make such purchases? Letby, after saying she's not sure what finances has to do with this, she says she used a shredder to shred bank statements. Why did you lie about not having a shredder in interview? Letby said she didn't recall having a shredder. It was not a significant item in her house. Like the pieces of paper? Letby agrees. Letby, when asked how she could have disposed of handover sheets, said to police in interview she did not have a shredder and if she did, that would be how she would dispose of confidential documents. Letby tells the court, quote, I can't recall at the time I'd just been arrested by the police. Locating a shredder wasn't on my mind. Mr Johnson asks when the shredder was bought. Letby says, shortly before this police interview, if I said it was bought recently. Mr Johnson asks about a shredder box in Letby's parents' home, in her bedroom wardrobe. Letby said, quote, It probably moved with me. She says she cannot recall definitively whether it was her parents' shredder. Mr Johnson says it was settled that the box had the word keep written on it. Letby said that was to keep the box and the shredder. Mr Johnson, but there is no shredder in the box. Letby, the shredder was elsewhere in the house. Letby agrees her parents would not go in her room at their parents' place. Mr Johnson asks why the word keep would be written on the box in that event. Lucy Letby, I can't answer that. Mr Johnson asks about a sympathy card written to Child Eye's family. Letby is asked where she wrote the card. Letby says she bought the card but cannot recall where specifically she wrote it. Letby says she wouldn't have written it on shift. Letby is asked why the photo was taken when she was at work. Letby replies, the card is written, it has been taken to work to hand over to a colleague who is going to the funeral. Nicholas Johnson, why did you take a picture at the place where the child died in dreadful circumstances? Letby said the place the photo was taken was insignificant. It was taken before the card was handed over to staff. Mr Johnson, another thing that is insignificant. Letby replies, I think that that is taken out of context. Mr Johnson, did it give you a bit of a thrill? Lucy Letby, absolutely not. Mr Johnson says in the defence, Letby's name is not referred to in the schedule surrounding the events for some babies. Are you suggesting the absence of your name from the schedule is showing you hadn't had contact with the child? Letby agrees in terms of the documentation at that time. She agrees that does not record events such as minor nursing responses if a baby starts crying. Letby says she has been to the unit on days off, such as finishing documentation that hasn't been done in the day or seeing colleagues who have been on a course. Letby says a record would be made as the swipe data would record her entrance as the only way she could get into the unit. Mr Johnson says for child G, Letby did not leave work until 10am on September the 7th. Letby replies, that's not unusual. A message is shown from 10.56pm on September the 7th. Letby, she looks awful doesn't she? Hope you get some sleep. Letby said if there was a sick baby on the unit, quote, you would go and check on them, that's not unreasonable. She had looked at Child G's charts and accepts she was not on duty at that time. 
Letby said she had been in to finish some documentation. Mr Johnson tells the court this was a big day for child G, as it was her 100th day. Letby said, quote, yeah, she's declining bit by bit. Mr Johnson says there is no record of Letby entering the unit. He suggests Letby does not need a pass to gain entry to the unit. Letby says she would need a pass to swipe in and accepts unless another colleague opened the door for me. Letby adds if she had a legitimate reason to enter the unit, she would have entry accepted. Letby is asked why she entered the unit at around 11pm, not earlier that day. Letby, it's quieter at night, I don't know, I can't say why I've gone in at night. Mr Johnson asks to clarify an issue relating to nasogastric tube feeds. Letby explains to the court how an NG tube feed is administered to a baby. Nicholas Johnson, have you ever used a plunger syringe to speed up the flow of milk? Letby, no. Nicholas Johnson, have you ever sent texts to your friend while giving an NGT feed? Letby, no. Letby says that would be inappropriate and impractical. She says the times on the feed charts would be done to the next 15 minutes, such as for 9am that feed would be between 8.45 and 9.15am. Letby says she has never used her phone in a clinical area. She says the baby would take priority over texting her friends or colleagues. She says she has not texted anyone while a resuscitation is taking place on the unit, one that she was involved in. Letby said she would not provide commentary during a resuscitation. Mr Johnson asks about staffing levels. Letby agrees that babies in room 1 are not necessarily always intensive care babies or that babies in room 2 are always high dependency babies. Mr Johnson says if the jury conclude a baby was attacked, then it would be the attacker who was the common link. Letby replies, just because I was on the shift doesn't mean I have done anything. Mr Johnson says if the jury conclude attacks happened in four cases, then the common link between them all would be the attacker. Letby, that is for them to decide. Nicholas Johnson, on principle, do you agree? Letby, I don't think I can answer that. Mr Johnson asks about Letby's colleagues. Letby says she did not have a disagreement with Dr Gail Beach or Dr Andrew Brunton and had a good working relationship with them. For Dr Stephen Breary, Letby said she did not have a problem with him at the time she was at work with him. She wrote a note calling him a profanity after she was redeployed as he and Dr Ravi Jayram had been making comments about Letby being implicated in the deaths of babies. Quote, They were very insistent that I be removed from the unit. Letby denies being in love with a doctor who cannot be named. Quote, I loved him as a friend. I was not in love with him. A note in Letby's handwriting is shown to the court. There is a suggestion the writing, previously said as, quote, Timmy, is Tiny Boy. Letby says her dog as a child had a nickname of Tiny Boy, while another of her childhood dogs was named Timmy. Letby said she had no issues with other doctors on the unit, including Dr John Gibbs, Dr Sally Ogden, Dr Alison Ventress and Dr David Harkness. For one other doctor, she said she did not have the best working relationship, but they got on. For Dr Ravi Jayram, quote, we had a normal working relationship. Nicholas Johnson, you searched for him on the internet. Letby, I searched for a lot of people. Letby says four doctors were in the conspiracy group, including Dr Jayram, Dr Gibbs and Dr Breary, quote, that they have apportioned blame on me. Letby is asked about failings in the hospital. Letby is asked if child E was poisoned with insulin. Quote, yes, I agree that he had insulin. Do you believe that somebody gave it to him unlawfully? Yes. Do you believe that someone targeted him? No. It was a random act? Yes, I, I don't know where the insulin came from. Do you agree child L was poisoned with insulin? From the blood results, yes. Do you agree that someone targeted him specifically? No, I don't know how the insulin got there. Letby adds, I don't believe any member of the staff on the unit would make a mistake in giving insulin. The judge asks if that is the case for child E. Letby agrees. She denies it was her who administered the insulin.
Let B is asked about the dangers of unprescribed insulin. Let B. It would cause them to be unwell. It would cause them to be hyperglycemic, seizures, apnea, even death. Let B is asked about her training, which, when completed, allowed her to care for intensive care babies. Let B is asked if that meant she would have access to room one more often than before. Let B agrees. The training involved education about lines, access and the complication of air embolus, the court hears. Let B said she had heard of air embolus by the time police interviewed her. She tells the court, all staff know that air introduced can lead to death. Nicholas Johnson, everybody knows the danger of air embolus. Lucy Let B, I can't speak for everyone. Mr Johnson asks about the case of child A. Letby says she did have independent memory of child A. Before child A, had you ever known a child to die unexpectedly within 24 hours of birth? Letby, I can't recall. I'm not sure. Letby says she can recall two or three baby deaths prior at the Countess of Chester Hospital and several at her placement in Liverpool Women's Hospital. Mr Johnson says Letby had previously told police it was two at Liverpool. Letby says her memory would have been clearer back then. Letby says it was discussed at the time child A's antiphospholipid syndrome could have been a contributing factor at the time. Letby tells the court, in part, staffing levels were a contributing part in child A's death due to a lack of fluids for four hours and issues with the UVC line. She says they were contributing factors and put child A at increased risk of collapse. I can't tell you how child A died, but there were contributing factors that were missed. Letby says the issues with child A's lines made him more vulnerable, with one of the lines not being connected to anything. Letby is asked why she didn't record this on the Datix form. Letby replies, it was discussed amongst staff at the time. I didn't feel the need to do a Datix. It had been raised verbally with two senior staff, one Dr J-Ram and one senior nursing staff. She adds, I don't know why child A died. Letby says if the cause of death was established as air embolus, then it would have to come from the person connecting the fluids, which wasn't me. Nicholas Johnson. Do you accept you were by child A at the time he collapsed? Letby. I accept that I was in his cot space checking equipment. Yes, I was in his close vicinity. Nicholas Johnson. Could you reach out and touch him? Letby. I could touch his incubator. The incubator was closed. Nicholas Johnson. Could you touch his lines? Letby. No. Letby says there's no way of knowing from the signatures who administered the medication between the two nurses, Letby or nurse Melanie Taylor. Dr David Harkness recalled to the court, quote, There was a very unusual patchiness of the skin, which I have never seen before and only seen since in cases at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Let me disagrees with that skin colour description for child A. She agrees with Dr Harkness that child A had mottling with purple and white patches. Let me says she cannot recall any blotchiness. I didn't see it. If he says he saw it, that's for him to justify. It's not something I saw. I was present and I did not see those. Dr Ravi Jayram said child A was pale, very pale, and referred to unusual patches of discoloration. Let be. I don't agree with the description of discoloration. I agree he was pale. Let be disagrees with the description of child A being blue, with pink patches flitting around. An experienced nurse of 20 years, who the court hears was a friend of Letby, said, quote, I've never seen a baby look that way before. He looked very ill. Letby agrees child A looked ill. She disagrees with the nurse's statement of the discoloration or the blotchiness on child A's skin. I agree he was white with what looked like purple markings. Letby agrees with the statement that the colouring came on very suddenly. Mr Johnson refers to Letby's police interview in which Letby was asked to interpret what she had seen on child A. Letby explained to police Motling was blotchy red markings on the skin, like reddy purple. Child A was centrally pale. In police interview, Letby was asked about what she saw on child A. 
She said, I think from memory, the mottling was more on the side the line was in. I think it was his left. Letby tells the court she felt child A was more pale than mottled. She says it was unusual for child A to be pale and to have discoloration on the side, but there was nothing unusual about the type of discoloration itself. Mr Johnson asks about the bag being kept for testing. Letby says she cannot recall if she followed up if the bag was tested. She had handed it over to the shift leader. Letby is asked if she accepts child A did not have a normal respiratory problem. Letby agrees. Mr Johnson asks if Letby has ever seen an arrhythmia in a neonate. Letby replies, no, I don't think so, no. Mr Johnson says air bubbles were found in child A afterwards. Did you inject child A with air? No. Mr Johnson asks if Letby was keen to get back to room 1 after this event. Letby says from her experience at Liverpool Women's Hospital, she was taught to get back and carry on as soon as possible. Letby had been asked what the dangers of air embolus were, and she had not known. Were you playing daft? No, every nurse knows the dangers. Letby said she did not know how an air embolus would progress, but knew the ultimate risk was death. The trial is now resuming after a lunch break. Nicholas Johnson KC says there is one thing he overlooked from the morning's evidence. He asks Lucy Letby why she said blotchiness rather than mottling in part of her police statement. I think they are interchangeable, Letby tells the court. Asked if staffing levels or mistakes had contributed to the collapse of child B, Letby says she does not know what caused child B's collapse. She says she does not recall child B's father lying on the floor following child B's collapse. A text message from Let B includes, Dad was on the floor crying, saying please don't take our baby away when I took him to the mortuary. It's just heartbreaking. Let B says she does not recall that. Let B says in this case, she did not want to care for child B so soon after the death of child A, as unlike the Liverpool example, she had been taught of getting back on the horse, Mr Johnson's words, and being back in nursery room one. This was with the same family. Letby accepts Child B did well on the day shift of June 9th. Letby is asked if Child B's parents stood guard in the unit following the death of twin Child A. Letby. They were very much present on the unit and we allowed for that. A diagram for the night shift of June 9th 10th shows Letby was in nursery room 3 for that night shift looking after two babies. Child B was in room 1. Letby says she got on well with all her nursing colleagues. Letby recalls evidence from court by a nurse colleague on March 21st, in which Letby had said working in nurseries 3 and 4 was, quote, boring. Letby tells the court, I have never been bored at work. I would never describe my work as boring. Mr Johnson goes through the timeline of Child B's events. A message from Letby to Yvonne Griffiths said, quote, hard coming in and seeing the parents. Mr Johnson says she is engaged in chit-chat with a friend between 8.41 to 9.10pm on the night shift in a social context. Letby says that sort of conversation was not limited to just her. Mr Johnson says further messages are exchanged between 9.12 to 9.32pm. Letby says all members of staff use their phones on the unit. She says it was accepted. She says she cannot comment for the whole unit, but her designated babies were being cared for. She says she does not believe there were staffing issues. I can't see what's going on with the other babies at this time, she said. Further messages are exchanged involving Letby, some in a social context, up to 10.28pm. Mr Johnson says in the middle of the block of messages, Letby signs for medication for a baby at 10.20pm. Letby says she didn't use her phone in clinical areas. A further block of messages are exchanged on Letby's phone between 10.38 to 10.59pm. Nicholas Johnson. Were you bored? Letby. No. Nicholas Johnson. As a matter of fact, do you text a lot when in room free? Letby. I text regardless of where I am on shift. Nicholas Johnson. Even with an ITU baby in room one? Let be. 
Yes, and I think everyone else would say the same if they were honest. Letby says she was working in Nursery One at points during the shift. She accepts that following Child B's collapse, she was in Room One. A document for a TPN bag and lipid administration is signed by Letby at 11.40pm on June 9th. Letby says an observation form at what appears to be 10 past midnight has what Letby accepts could be her handwriting. It is similar to the writing in the next column which is initialled by Letby. A blood gas record is shown for 12.16am. Letby accepts she is there at that time as two nurses are needed to carry out the test. Letby says she was unsure whether she or a colleague had alerted the other to Child B's deterioration. Letby, I can't sit here and say definitively which way now, no. Nicholas Johnson, you injected Child B with air, didn't you? Letby, no, I didn't. Mr Johnson asks about Child B's appearance. Letby had earlier told her defence Child B became quite mottled, dark all over. Letby was asked if she had seen that mottling before. Yes, it was like general mottling that we do see on babies, adding, it was not unusual, but it was a concern, in light of child A's decline the night before. Letby tells the court the mottling was more pronounced than usually found. In police interview, Letby had said the mottling was more than seen on child A, who was pale centrally. It was darker. Letby also said there was a rash appearance. Letby tells the court it was a more pronounced mottling, but was still mottling. Nicholas Johnson, are you saying this was normal? Letby says it was not normal, but something which would be seen. It was more pronounced than general mottling. She says it came very quickly, and in the context of child A, everyone acted very quickly. Mr Johnson asks why a doctor asked for someone to get a camera. Letby. In view of what had happened to child A the night before, we did not want to take any chances. Child B's mother describes the motling event, and the consultant had, quote, never seen this before, and the mother was surprised at this. Do you accept what child A and B's mother said? Let B. I accept there was motling, yes. She says she does not recall the consultant saying that she was not there when it was said. Letby tells the court she went immediately to get a camera, and when she returned, the motling had gone. A doctor had said child B was a very pale, dusky colour, and then developing widespread blotches, patches of purpley red colour. Letby said she was not there at that point, as she may have been getting the camera. She says she did not see that on child B. She says no conversation was ever had about that. The judge asked if there was anything that could have led to the doctor to be mistaken in her description. Letby replies, no, I just saw Motling. Letby says the Motling was purply red. Another doctor had described a blotchiness to one side. Letby says she did not take over care of child B from a senior nurse of 20 years experience. She says the senior nurse was busy with the family. The court is shown Let B is a co-signer for a number of medications following Child B's collapse with the senior nurse. Let B denies suggesting antiphospholipid syndrome was a cause of Child B's death. Mr Johnson asks if Let B accepts Child A and Child B had air administered. Let B replies, no. Mr Johnson turns to the case of Child C. Let B is asked to look at her defence statement. Let me recall she did not believe she was in room one and cannot recall how she ended up in room one. Possibly it was a result of child C's alarm going off. Let B in her statement said she had been involved in speaking to the family afterwards, but not to the extent child C's mother had said. Mr Johnson said a nurse had given evidence to say Let B had to be removed from the family room after child C died. Mr Johnson says Letby's vague recollection of events is untrue. Letby, I don't agree with that. Nicholas Johnson, I'm going to suggest you enjoyed what happened and that is why you were in the family room. Letby, no. Letby is asked why she did not remember Child C in police interview. Letby says she remembered once provided with further details. She adds... I don't know how Child C died. 
She rules out staffing levels, medical incompetencies or someone making a mistake. Mr Johnson says this is a case where one of the nursing notes by Avon Griffiths was misfiled to a different baby and was, after child C died, refiled back to child C. Mr Johnson asks Letby if nursing notes timestamped by their start and end are editable. Letby replies, no. The court hears because of this the note had to be re-entered into the system. The rewritten note is shown to the court. The note is for the June 12 day shift. It includes no apneas noted and caffeine given as prescribed. Long line inserted by Dr Beach on second attempt. Child C unsettled at times, soothes with pacifier and enjoyed kangaroo skin to skin care with parents. A nursing note by Joanne Williams is shown to the court for child C on the day shift. Child C very unsettled and fractious. Child C taken off CPAP while out having skin to skin with mummy. Calm down straight away with mummy. Let be agrees this was a positive picture for child C. Child C was on CPAP breathing support to 10am, then was taken off it for a couple of hours, then was on Optiflow breathing support for the rest of his life. Mr Johnson moves on to the shift in which Letby was present. A shift rotor is shown to the court, showing Letby was looking after two babies that night on June 13th. She was in nursery room 3, with child C in room 1 that night. Mr Johnson says this was another shift when Letby had migrated to room 1. Letby replies, yes, in response to child C's care needs. She says she has no recollection of going to see child C prior to his collapse. Letby says she was unhappy at being in room 3 for that shift, as opposed to room 1, but that was the decision of the prior shift leader. Letby's nursing colleague had said Letby's designated baby in room 3 needed attention, after Letby had asked if she could be redeployed to room 1 that night. Letby replies, yes, they did need attention and I gave them attention. Letby had sent a message to Jennifer Jones Key, quote, I just keep thinking about Monday, feel I need to be in room 1 to overcome it, but colleagues said no. Jennifer Jones Key, I agree with her, don't think it will help. You need a break from full-on ITU. You have to let it go or it will eat you up. I know not easy and will take time. Lucy Letby. Not the vented baby necessarily. I just feel I need to be in one to get the image out of my head. Mella said the same and colleague let her go. Being in three is eating me up. All I can see is him in one. It probably sounds odd but it's how I feel. Jennifer Jones Key. Well it's up to you but don't think it's going to help. It sounds very odd and I would be complete opposite. Can understand colleague trying to look after you. Lucy Letby. Well that's how I feel. From when I've experienced it at women's, I've needed to go straight back and have a sick baby, otherwise the image of the one you lost never goes. Why send Mel in if she's trying to look after us? She was in bits over it. Don't expect people to understand, but I know how I feel and how I've dealt with it before. I've voiced that, so can't do any more, but people should respect that. Jennifer Jones Key. Okay. Jennifer Jones Key. I think they do respect it but also trying to help you. Why don't you go in one for a bit? Lucy Letby. Yeah I've done a couple of meds in one. I'll be fine. Jennifer Jones Key. It didn't sound like you would be. Sorry was eating my tea. Lucy Letby. Forget I said anything. I'll be fine. It's part of the job. Just don't feel like there's much team spirit tonight. Jennifer Jones Key. I'm not going to forget but just think you're way too hard on yourself. It is part of the job but the worst part. But I do believe it makes us stronger people. Lucy Letby. Unfortunately I've seen my fair share at women so you're supported differently and here it's like people want to tell you how to think and feel. Anyway onwards and upwards. Just a shame I'm on with Mel and colleague. Sophie in one so haven't got her to talk to either. Jennifer Jones Key. Work is work. A lot of the girls say women's don't support and tell them to get on with it. I think they don't mean to tell you though and were over caring sometimes. Yeah that's not good but you got Liz. Lucy Letby. Women's can be awful but I learnt the hard way that you have to speak up to get support. I lost a baby one day and a few hours later was given another dying baby just born in the same cot space. Girls there said it was important to overcome the image. It was awful but by the end of the day I realised they were right. It's just different here. 
Anyway, forget it. I can only talk about it properly to those who knew him and Mel not interested, so I'll overcome it myself. You get some sleep. Lebby accepts there were two babies in room one, but does not accept she was specifically wanting to look after child C. Lebby tells the court, it wasn't about me wanting to get my own way. Lebby accepts she was upset, just generally, that her feelings weren't being considered by a colleague and Melanie Taylor. Mr Johnson interjects and asks if this was the Melanie Taylor who Letby had said potentially caused a child's death. Letby replies, potentially, yes. Jennifer Jones Key. That's a bit mean, isn't it? Don't have to know him to understand. We've all been there. Yep, off to bed now. Lucy Letby. I don't mean it like that. Just only those who saw him know what image I have in my head. Forget it. I'm obviously making more of it than I should. Letby tells the court she had hoped Jennifer Jones Key would have been more understanding to how she was feeling, and was frustrated, and the conversation was not going anywhere, so she wanted to leave the conversation. Letby says her colleague Sophie Ellis was the least experienced member of staff on that shift and did not have the skills for the job of looking after small premature babies in room one. I did not think she was qualified for the job. She did not have the skills for premature babies in room one. She denies that Sophie Ellis did anything to cause child C's collapse. Mr Johnson asks, she had something you wanted. Letby replied, no. The court hears Sophie Ellis's statement saying when she entered room one, Letby was by child C's cot side saying, quote, he's just dropped, his heart rate saturations, or words to that effect. The court is shown a neonatal schedule for the night shift of June 13th, 14th, 2015. Letby is shown recording observations for her designated babies and made medication prescriptions for babies not in room one. Letby says the medications for those babies would have been drawn up in room one. Quote, they could not have been done in a special care nursery. Letby says if Sophie Ellis has documented correctly, there would have been no air in child C's stomach after an aspiration was made for the baby's feed. Letby denies taking, in Mr Johnson's words, an opportunity to sabotage child C. In police interview, it is put to Letby that child C collapsed six minutes after she sent the last of her text messages. Letby states, I don't recall where I was at the time. Letby says she may have been in a nursing station before going into room one. Letby said she did not recall being cotside, but accepted Sophie Ellis' account at the time it was put to her by the police. The death of Child C was very memorable, wasn't it? Yes. Nicholas Johnson KC for the prosecution is continuing to cross-examine and is asking Lucy Letby questions in the case of Child C. Mr Johnson says text messages were exchanged between Letby and her colleague Jennifer Jones Key between 11.01 and 11.09pm. Letby says she does not accept she was in room one at the time of child C's collapse. She says she has no memory of it. Nurse Sophie Ellis had said she was in room one at the time and Letby said in police interview based on that that she was indeed in room one. Letby says she disputes that as she has no memory of it. Do you dispute being born? Mr Johnson asks. No, Letby replies. But you have no memory of it? Letby replies, no. Letby is asked why she let a band for nursery nurse look after her designated baby. Letby says it's not unusual for band for nurses to assist her in her duties. Letby, I have no memory of that. Nicholas Johnson, did you have something better to do? Letby. No. Mr Johnson says the text at 11.01pm sent by Letby to Jennifer Jones Key meant she must not have been in a clinical area and would not have had time to feed her designated baby in room three. Letby. I can't answer that. Mr Johnson says it took her out of the nursing area. Letby said she would have been in the doorway of the unit. Mr Johnson says Melanie Taylor in evidence described Letby as cool and calm. Letby does not dispute that. She disputes saying to Melanie Taylor that child C had had a braddy as she has no memory of it. Notes by Dr Catherine Davis are shown to the court for child C's collapse. At the time of arrival, quote, chest compressions in progress, occasional intermittent gasps noted. 
and able to pass ET tube as chords plus plus. The court hears the chords were swollen. Mr Johnson asks Letby if it was a theme that when doctors went to intubate they had difficulties with swollen cords and or bleeding. Letby accepts that was the case. She denies putting anything down Charles C's throat. Mr Johnson, do you agree something caused Charles C's stomach to dilate before the collapse? Letby says the stomach dilation could have been caused by the Neopuff resuscitation. Letby is asked if she had seen the kind of decline as seen by Child C before. Letby says she has, but not the way Child C cling to life. Nicholas Johnson, you enjoyed the aftermath of this, didn't you? Letby, no. Why were you so keen to spend time with Child C's family as they cradled their dying child? Letby, I don't agree with that. I wasn't there a lot of the time. Let be disputes being repeatedly in the family room afterwards, adding, quote, I don't recall my colleague having to pull me out of there. She disputes the statement made by her colleague. Let be is asked what useful function she was contributing to the family during the dreadful situation they were going through. Let be said she cannot recall, other than gathering the mementos, which is a two person job. Letby says she would have to see the bereavement checklist charts to see if there was anything she had co-signed, as otherwise she does not recall and has no memory. The judge asks if hand and footprints are collected when the baby is still alive. Letby replies they can be, or after they have passed. Letby denies that she was enjoying what was going on. Mr Johnson now moves on to the case of Child D. Letby's defence statement said she did not believe she had any involvement with Child D until the baby girl's collapse. Letby says she was affected by Child D's death, as were all the staff on the unit. In police interview, Letby said she could not recall Child D. Letby recalls looking after two babies in room one on the night of June 21st, 22nd. Caroline Oakley was the designated nurse for Child D and the baby in room two. Letby accepts from time to time she would have been alone in room one as Caroline Oakley split her time caring for the two babies between the two rooms. Part of a statement from Child D's mother is read out. Letby disputes she was the nurse who held a phone to Dr Brunton's ear while resuscitation efforts were going on. Letby says she can recall there was such an incident as it was talked about after the event. She agrees it happened but she disagrees it was her who made the phone call. Mr Johnson asks about a series of Countess nursing staff's descriptions of the unusual skin discoloration and an odd rash. Some of them said it was something they had not seen before. Letby says she does not dispute the staff's descriptions. Nicholas Johnson. Do you still not remember Child D? Letby. I didn't recall at the time of my police interview. No. Do you remember her now? Yes. Do you remember the circumstances surrounding her death? No. Let me message a colleague on June 22nd. Child D came out in this weird rash, looking like overwhelming sepsis. Let me said she had not seen the type of rash before, but she had seen something similar in her training years before. The message added, quote, then collapsed and had full recess, so upsetting for everyone. Parents absolutely distraught. Dad screaming. Mr Johnson asks if Letby was lying to police when she said she didn't remember Child D. Letby replies, no. Letby's text message added, quote, Andrew Brunton and Liz Newby said it will probably be investigated. Hmm, well it's happened and that's it. Got to carry on. Mr Johnson said he had earlier asked if that was Letby's reaction to Child D's death. Letby replies, I don't think it was meant in the context you are suggesting. We've got to move forward. It's not meant to be any insensitivity to the parents or Child D. Mr Johnson asks about the Facebook search for Child D's mother on June 25th, 2015. He asks how she remembers the name of Child D's mother if she did not recall Child D in police interview in 2018. Letby says she recalled the name of the mother in June 2015. Nicholas Johnson. You have got a good memory for names? Letby. Yes. You carry them in your head? Yeah. 
Would you say you've got a good memory? Yeah. Let be is asked about messages she exchanged with Minna Lapalainen on June 26th, in which she said, quote, What I have seen has really hit me tonight. Mina suggests a counsellor for Letby. Letby, quote, I can't talk about it now. I can't stop crying. The reply suggests Letby take time off and consider if she should be at work during this time. Letby replies she has to keep carrying on working after saying, quote, I just have to let it all out. Nicholas Johnson. This was a very memorable time of your life, wasn't it? Letby. Yes. Messages between Letby and a colleague are exchanged. The colleague said there was something odd about what had happened. Letby is asked if what do you mean was what she really thought as per her response. Nicholas Johnson. Were you worried that people were starting to put two and two together? Letby. No. Letby had messaged, quote, odd that we lost three in different circumstances. Lucy tells the court the circumstances were different. The colleague, quote, I don't know, were they that different? Ignore me, I'm speculating. The colleague says there was talk of doing a joint post-mortem for three babies who had died. Letby searched for the father of Child D on October the 3rd, 2015. You didn't really forget Child D, did you? Letby. I didn't recall specific details in interview. Mr Johnson says Facebook does not archive the name searches beyond a certain number, so every time Letby searched a name, it would be from memory, and Letby accepts that. Letby says Child D did not have appropriate treatment at the start of her life, and that may have had an impact on her later in life. Nicholas Johnson. The lack of antibiotics early on don't cause an air embolus, do they? Letby replies, no. Letby is asked if Caroline Oakley's notes showed Child D was stable prior to the collapse. Do you accept the evidence that Child D's designated nurse in room one, Caroline Oakley, was on a break when Child D collapsed? Letby says she cannot recall. I cannot say either way because I don't know. Do you want to make any further comment about it? No. Letby accepts that if Caroline Oakley was on a break, the other nurse in room one was herself. Catherine Percival Ward had also given evidence saying Caroline Oakley was on a break. Mr Johnson tells the court. Nicholas Johnson. Do you accept that Caroline Oakley was on a break? Let be. Yes. The neonatal schedule is shown to the court. Mr Johnson says there is nothing for Letby's name between 1am and 1.30, the latter when Child D collapsed. A blood gas record is shown for Child D at 1.14am. Nicholas Johnson. That was done by you, wasn't it? Letby. I don't know. Nicholas Johnson. That's your writing, isn't it? Letby. It could be. Mr Johnson asserts it is. Let be. It looks like my writing, yes. Mr Johnson asked why it isn't signed by her. It's just an oversight, like the next line, which also isn't signed. It's an error. Observations for Child D are shown, including readings at 1.15am, and it is signed by Caroline Oakley. Mr Johnson says Caroline Oakley had told the court she got those details for the 1.15am observation, quote, from the girls. Letby says she does not remember that bit of evidence. Letby says she does not recall who was looking after Child D when Caroline Oakley was on her break. An infusion chart is shown where Child D is given a saline bolus. Letby says the handwriting in the date and time started column is likely to be hers. Did you take the opportunity while Caroline was out to sabotage Child D? No. Mr Johnson says, you were standing over her when the alarms went off, weren't you? I don't recall. Mr Johnson says who the candidates could have been. One of the nurses says she wasn't there in evidence. Another is Catherine Percival Ward and Letby agrees she could have been there. Another nurse is discounted. Letby says she cannot recall if it was her who was in room one. A fluid balance chart is shown to the court with the note quote, oral secretions plus plus. Letby says the handwriting could be hers. Letby said it could have been something she had documented alongside Caroline Oakley. 
Mr. Johnson suggests Letby was babysitting child D. Letby adds she cannot comment if she had been in nursery room one throughout. The neonatal schedule is shown to the court. Letby denies she has ever falsified paperwork to make it look like she was doing one activity at one time when doing another. The schedule shows Letby was involved in giving medications to child D before the second collapse at 3am. Nicholas Johnson. Do you remember that? Letby. No. An infusion chart for child D is made by Letby and Caroline Oakley at 3.20am. Nicholas Johnson. Child D died because you injected her with air, didn't you? No. No, I did not give her air. Letby said she was looking after other babies, not just child D. Lucy Letby. I tried to be as cooperative as I could be to police in interview. Letby asks for a break. Mr Johnson says he just requires to tidy up something which should take two minutes in the case of child C. He refers to the bereavement checklist. Letby says hand and footprints were taken before death in certain cases. Mr Johnson says the checklist is, quote, for staff following neonatal death. The judge says there will be an early lunch break and the court will resume at 1.45pm. Nicholas Johnson KC, on behalf of the prosecution, asks about the case of Child E. He asks Lucy Letby if it was medical incompetence that led to Child E's death, in that the night shift team could have reacted sooner to the child's bleed. Letby replies, possibly, yes. She says once Child E was bleeding at 10pm, a transfusion could have been made sooner. She says the collective team were responsible. Letby says it was, quote, an important thing to know that plumbing issues were a potential contributory factor to the decline of baby's health in the unit. She said raw sewage would come out of the sinks in nursery room one as flow back from another unit. Mr Johnson asked if Letby ever filled in a Datix form for that. Letby says she did not. Mr Johnson says Letby did fill in a Datix form for child E. The form is shown to the court. It is dated August the 4th, 2015 at 5.53am, which is when the form was signed and filed. It is classed as a, quote, clinical incident. The risk grading was high potential harm. Letby says she is not sure about that, as it also says actual harm, none, no harm caused. It refers to the death of child E at 1.40am. Description, unexpected death following GI bleed. Full resus, unsuccessful. Time of death, 1.40am. The baby's history is recorded in the events leading up to his death. It was filled in by the Instant Review Group panel. Letby's input on the panel is reporting the incident on the first page of the nine-page report. Letby is asked if she remembers sending a text message to her colleague Jennifer Jones Key saying it was, quote, too quiet on August 2nd, 2015. Letby says she cannot recall, but accepts that would be something she could send. Letby says there is always something to do, but sometimes they can be long night shifts if you haven't got many babies. She says she enjoyed being busy when it was managed. Letby is asked why she, and not Child E's designated nurse Melanie Taylor, signed a correction to a prescription for Child E. Letby says it's standard practice for two nurses to administer prescriptions, and corrections on the form are not based on seniority. She agrees that she was keen to raise issues if they needed correcting. Nicholas Johnson. Had you fallen out with Melanie Taylor by this stage? Letby. No. Letby denies she had fallen out with anyone. She agrees she had confidence in her clinical competencies. Nicholas Johnson. Do you agree you were a cut above some other nurses, including Mel? Letby. No. A nursing note for child E from the evening of August 3rd, 2015 is shown. Letby agrees he was progressing well, although he needed insulin. Letby agrees that child E at this stage showed no sign of gastrointestinal problems. A rotor is shown to the court, showing Letby was the designated nurse for child E and death in room one. No other babies, nurses were allocated in that room that night. Letby is asked if there was anything wrong with this arrangement. Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson says when Letby was giving evidence to Mr Myers, her defence barrister, 
She said when the mother arrived at the unit, she was, quote, bringing milk. Letby says she does not recall from her memory. Mr Johnson says that was what she said on May 5th. Letby replies, I can't recall, right here, right now. Letby says she cannot remember it specifically, but accepted that version of events. Quote, I don't have any clear memory. Mr Johnson refers to the transcript from that day, in which Letby told Benjamin Myers Casey she believed Child E's mother had arrived at the unit bringing expressed breast milk. Letby says, I said I think she brought expressed breast milk. Mr Johnson asks about the significance of 9pm that night. Letby replies, I don't know what you mean. Mr Johnson says it's the mother's evidence that she knew Child E was due a feed at 9pm, so came down to the unit for that feed. Mr Johnson says Letby's recollection that Child E's mother brought milk with her fixes the time as being 9pm. Letby replies, I don't agree. Mr Johnson asks about the 16 mil mucky aspirate, which Letby agrees was taken before 9pm. Mr Johnson asks where the milk for the 9pm feed was coming from. Letby says the milk would come from the milk fridge in nursery room 1. She says she does not remember where the milk would come from for this feed specifically. No feed was recorded for 9pm. Mr Johnson says the SHO did not record no feed for 9pm having said in evidence that would be the sort of thing he would record for a baby. Letby says sometimes doctors don't record such notes. Letby is asked why the large vomit of fresh blood is not recorded on the observation chart for 10pm. Letby says she recorded it in her nursing notes and Dr David Harkness was present when it happened. Letby is asked why she waited over an hour for the observation of the aspirate to be raised with the doctor. Lucy Letby replies... I don't recall speaking to a doctor. Letby does, however, recall speaking to an SHO about it on the phone. Letby says there was no observation of blood prior to 10pm. Nicholas Johnson. Was Childie's mother telling the truth about you? Lucy Letby. In what sense? In the sense of what you said to her. When she says she came down to see her boys, she saw Child E with blood around his lips. Chaldee's mother's illustration of what she says was present on Chaldee's lips is shown to the court. Nicholas Johnson. Did you ever see anything like that? Lucy Letby. Child E did have blood like that after 2200. Letby adds there was no blood prior to that. Letby accepts she was alone in room 1 when the mother came down. She says that would have been around the handover time at 8pm. Nicholas Johnson. You are not telling the truth about that. Are you? Lucy Letby. Yes, I am. Letby says she does not accept causing an injury to harm Child E. She denies at any stage having a fallout with Child E's mother. Letby says she has never seen a baby with blood like that around her mouth in her career. She agrees it was wholly exceptional. She denies telling Child E's mother the cause of the bleed was via insertion of a nasogastrinal tube. Letby is asked if she recalls telling the police in the case of Child N that NG tubes can cause bleeding. Letby says it does cause blood, but not in the mouth. Mr Johnson says Letby has said that previously it can cause oral bleeding. Letby replies, OK. She denies saying that happened in this case. She says, medically speaking, any baby could have a bleed like the sort seen by Child E. A text message from Letby to Jennifer Jones Key is shown. Quote, he had a massive hemorrhage that could have happened to any baby. Letby says at the time it was thought Child E could have NEC and any baby could have had the condition Child E had. Letby is asked to look at her defence statement. She says Child E's mother had come down with some expressed milk. The statement is dated February 2021. Let be in her statement said, quote, This may have been later than 2100. Mr. Johnson says Letby is now ruining out a time before 2200. Letby says she cannot say definitively, but there was no blood prior to 2200. Letby is asked why she did not mention the vomit when blood went down the NG tube in her defence statement. Mr. Johnson says Letby is lying by adding additional detail afterwards. Letby denies this. 
Mr Johnson asks about the quote mucky aspirate for child E, asking if that is 16 mil of bile, as per Letby's defence statement. Letby says there was bile in the mucky aspirate. Mr Johnson says there is a difference between bile stained and bile. Letby accepts there was 16 mil of bile in her defence statement and that is an error. She is asked why she put that in, in those terms. Letby replies, I don't know. Letby says this is a clarification of her earlier statement. Nicholas Johnson, you are lying, aren't you? Lucy Letby replies, no. The defence statement also refers to, quote, blood in the nappy for child E after he died. Mr Johnson asks if that has been heard in her evidence. Letby says she cannot recall. Letby says it is written in her nursing notes and nothing was done about it as child E was deceased by that time. Letby is asked to look at her nursing notes. Mr Johnson says Letby's nursing notes for child E, as read by Letby during the break, do not record blood in the nappy. Letby says she could not recall her notes specifically at this time. Mr Johnson reads about what other medical staff observed following child E's collapse. Dr David Harkness recorded for child E's observations following the collapse, quote, kind of strange purple patches that appeared on the outside of his tummy. Letby says it was purple, but not patches. Letby said the other parts were more pale than the pink described by Dr Harkness. Dr Harkness said he'd only ever seen it before with child A. Letby disagrees. She says it was, quote, not the same. Asked to explain the differences between the two, Letby says it was a, quote, solid block of purpleness for child E and a more mottled look for child A. Letby agrees it was over the abdomen, but disagrees the purple patches moved around. Mr Johnson reads through another doctor's observations, who said she had not seen a discoloration, but Dr Harkness was animated when he was describing what he had seen to her. Letby says she was not there for the conversation between the two of them. Letby is asked to read her retrospective nursing note for child E, which described Charles E's collapse and subsequent decline until he died in his parents' arms at 1.40am. The note would have been made with reference to medical notes, Letby tells the court. Letby is asked to look at an observation chart for blood and gas. Letby says when things are going on, it would be standard practice to write also on the back of handover sheets or spare bits of paper. Letby is asked about a purple band of discoloration she had recorded for child E. In her police interview, Letby accepts struggling to recall the size of it at the time. Mr Johnson says for the evidence given on May 5th, Letby said it was a quote, red horizontal banding across his abdomen and only on the abdomen. Letby agrees with Dr Harkness it was on the abdomen, but does not agree with Dr Harkness's observation it was patches. Letby is asked to look at a chart showing aspirates for child E, which included, quote, minimal aspirates prior to the collapse. Letby agrees that showed no signs of gastrointestinal issues for child E until the 9pm reading of 16 mil mucky aspirate in her writing. Letby cannot recall why Belinda Simcock had written in the 10pm aspirates column. Letby assumes the blood came out following those 10pm readings. Why was Belinda there at all? Letby replies, I can't say for sure. Letby says Belinda had come to assist for the 16 mil aspirate observed an hour earlier. Letby says she cannot say why Belinda was carrying out observations at that time. Letby says she cannot explain why the blood aspirate is not recorded in the aspirate chart, but is in her nursing notes. Letby is asked to read a note on the schedule for child E, in which it is said Belinda Simcock gave a feed to a child in room 2 at 10pm. Letby says she cannot recall why Belinda Simcock had come to room 1 for the 10pm readings. Mr Johnson asks if Belinda Simcock was brought in to sign paperwork at the time of the collapse to cover for Letby's actions. Letby denies this. Letby said Belinda Simcock had carried out the drip readings for child E and signed it, as specific information like that is not passed on from one nurse to another. Letby is asked if she recalls who rang child E's mother when child E collapsed. 
She said it would have been a collective decision to contact the midwifery staff. Lepi accepts Chaldi's mother made a phone call at 9.11pm, but does not accept the evidence of the conversation about Child E, quote, bleeding from his mouth and there was, quote, nothing to worry about. Benjamin Myers Casey, for Letby's defence, rises to say Letby cannot say what was or what was not said in a phone call she was not a part of. Nicholas Johnson. You killed Child E, didn't you? No. Why in the aftermath were you so obsessed with Child E and F's mother? I don't think I was obsessed. Letby says she often thought of Child E and Child F. Mr Johnson says the name of Child E and F's mother was searched for nine times and the name of the father once. Letby said she searched to see how Child F was doing. One of the searches was when Child F was on the neonatal unit. Letby said that other searches were made after Child F had left the unit, so collectively what she said was correct. Mr Johnson says Letby was looking for the family's reaction. Letby disagrees. One of the searches is on Christmas Day. Nicholas Johnson. Didn't you have better things to do? Letby said the family were on her mind. Mr Johnson tells the court he is now looking at the case of Child G. He will go out of sequence chronologically and deal with Child F at a later point. Letby says she cannot recall what Child G's due date would have been. Child G having been born at a gestational age of 23 weeks and 6 days on May the 31st, with the date of one of those events not standing out to her. A message from Letby's phone to a colleague, quote, Due date today! Exclamation mark. Letby says she knew back then at the time, September the 21st, 2015. Letby says the date of the event for Child G was a coincidence. Letby says Child G had extreme prematurity, which had complications requiring additional care. Letby disagrees that Child G was fine by the time she came to the Countess of Chester Hospital, saying she had a number of ongoing issues. Letby denies that Child G was ready to go home by the date of the first event on September 7th, saying babies in the special care room Nursery 4 can still be there for several weeks. Letby says Child G had a number of previous problems, including relating to feeding and had sepsis. Letby says Child G was on oxygen and had feeding issues by September the 7th, 2015. Mr Johnson asks Letby to look at Child G's nursing records for her days leading up to her projectile vomit. Letby agrees there is nothing unusual in those days. Feeding charts are shown for Child G for September 5th and 6th. Child G is being fed expressed breast milk via the NGT or bottle. Letby agrees the picture is looking good for Child G from these charts. Mr Johnson says the feed at 11pm on September 6th would not have been done twice by mistake. Letby says she has never suggested that has happened. Letby agrees the observations for Child G before 2am on September 7th are quote, good. Nicholas Johnson you knew this was day 100 of Child G's life, didn't you? Let be. Yes. It was a big day for her. Let be. Yes. Let be agrees she and other nurses would celebrate 100 day old babies on the unit and a banner had been prepared to mark the occasion. A staffing rotor for the night shift of September 6th, 7th is shown to the court. Let be is in room 1 as the designated nurse for one baby and Elsa Simpson is the designated nurse for one other baby in room 1. A nursing colleague is in room 2 as a designated nurse for child G. Let B rules out staffing levels or staffing competence as a contributory factor to child G's death. Asked if anyone had made a mistake, Let B says potentially child G had been overfed by a nursing colleague, but that was not what she was saying had happened. Let B quote, I can't say for definite that didn't happen. I'm not saying she did do that, but it is a possibility. Letby says it is a possibility the amount of milk was mismeasured when calculating the feed. Nicholas Johnson. Are you suggesting it's a realistic possibility? Letby. No. Nicholas Johnson KC continues to cross-examine Lucy Letby in the case of Child G. 
Letby says it was a possibility Child G was overfed by a nursing colleague, but adds, quote, I don't believe that happened. Mr Johnson says to overfeed Child G twice as much would have taken twice as long. Letby says 45 mils of milk feed would take around 15 to 20 minutes. Letby refers to medical experts Dr Evans and Dr Bowen that overfeeding was a possibility. Mr Johnson describes what Letby had seen, including that Child G's abdomen was firm and red, with the sight of that and vomit on the floor leaving her shocked. That was a clear recollection you had last week, giving evidence. Letby says that happened at approximately 2.15am. Her nursing note is shown to the court, quote, Child G had large projectile milky vomit at 02.15, continued to vomit plus plus, 45 mils of milk obtained from NG tube with air plus plus, abdomen noted to be distended and discoloured. Colour improved few minutes after aspirating tube, remained distended but soft, to go nil by mouth with IV fluids. Letby says she disagrees with the evidence of Dr Sandy Bowen, saying a pH reading of 4 can be obtained from milk aspirated from the stomach. A photo of Child G's cot with circles marking where the vomit fell outside of the cot is shown to the court. Letby is asked to look at her police interview for Child G. Letby said it was in her cot. Nicholas Johnson. This was an extraordinary vomit, the likes of which you had not seen in your career. Letby. I have, but not in neonates. Letby says it's an oversight she had not mentioned the extent of the vomit in police interview. Letby says Child G was still vomiting when she went to see Child G with Elsa Simpson. Nicholas Johnson. You were not there with her, were you? Letby. Yes, I was. Letby is asked to look at her police interview. She says at the time of the vomit she did not remember where she was, then went into the room where Child G was. Letby is asked why there is no mention of Elsa Simpson in the interview. Letby says she was describing her own response. The neonatal schedule is shown to the court for Child G. Mr Johnson says Letby deliberately misstated the time at which Child G had her vomit at 2.15am and says it was different. Letby disagrees. Mr Johnson refers to Dr Alison Ventress's notes, quote, Called to RV, Child G at 2.35. He says that is an accurate time, and Letby had misstated the time so Letby's colleague could instead be blamed for overfeeding, and Letby instead had overfed Child G. Letby replies, that's not true. Mr Johnson asks where the air came from before neopuffing. Letby says she cannot say without looking at the nursing notes. Letby's notes quote, 45 mils of milk obtained from NG tube with air plus plus. The note does not mention neopuffing. Letby says that is an oversight. Mr Johnson. The truth is that you injected child G with milk and air, didn't you? Letby replies, no. Letby is asked to look at her second police interview for child G. In it, Letby said air had got through the feeding syringe. She tells the court it had been suggested to her as a possibility. Mr Johnson refers to Child G's 3.15am collapse, with Dr Alison Ventress recalling blood-stained fluid coming up. Let B denies inserting something into Child G's airway and or causing the deterioration. Dr Ventress and a doctor colleague said, quote, 100 ml of air milk had been aspirated from Child G following the 6.05am desaturation. Letby says she does not recall 100 mils coming out and asks if it was documented. Dr Allison Ventress's note is shown to the court. It includes, quote, NG aspirated as abdo appeared very large, 100 mils aspirated. Letby, quote, I don't know how the air got there. It's after neopuffing. She accepts the note as an account of what happened. Letby is shown nursing notes made for the following day shift by a colleague. Letby agrees there are no signs Child G had a build-up of fluid or air from the notes made. Mr Johnson refers to the second bout of vomiting on September 21, 2015. 
Letby said she thought she recalled the mother was there, as it was during visiting time. Letby had said she did not believe it was an emergency and did not recall Child G going blue. Asked if she agrees with Child G's father that Child G was, quote, not the same after the first deterioration, Letby replies, I can't comment on that. Nobody knows their babies like the parents do. Mr Johnson asks why Letby was giving Child G the 9.15am feed on September the 21st. Letby replies, she wasn't awake and she was due her immunisations. Letby says, feeding-wise, she had no concerns with Child G. She said there was an ongoing issue with Child G's low temperature. For that September the 21st day shift, the court is shown the rotor. Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for Child G that day in room 4, along with two other babies. Lucy Letby was also responsible for a fourth baby rooming in with parents. Nicholas Johnson. Did it annoy you that you were in nursery room 4? Letby. Not at all. Mr Johnson says that Letby, when giving evidence, said aspirating can interrupt digestion. Letby replies, when fully aspirating, that can happen. She tells the court on this occasion, NGT feeds would be preferable for babies receiving immunisations as they can be quite unwell after them and they may need rest. The court is shown a feeding chart for child G. A 40ml feed of expressed breast milk was given at 9.15am signed by Letby. After the feed, there were 30ml, two projectile milk vomits, Letby noted. Child G also had a large bowel motion, loose, watery green, and there was a review by doctors. The note is again signed by Letby. She says she cannot recall which doctors carried out the review from that note. The 9am reading is recorded on the observation chart for the temperature. Mr Johnson suggests there are two dots in that column recording temperatures. Letby says she cannot recall what the line is below the dot. Nicholas Johnson. Did you go back and cook the charts to make it look like Child G was declining? Letby replies, no. Letby says both dots are in the normal range. Letby says, I haven't misdocumented anything. Two dots are recorded in the 3am column when Letby was not on shift. Letby suggests someone else has misdocumented. Letby's notes for that day are shown to the court. They include, quote, at 10.15, two large projectile milky vomits, brief self-resolving apnea and desaturation to 35% with colour loss. NG tube aspirated, 30 mils undigested milk discarded, abdomen distended, soft. Doctors asked to review. Temperature remains low. Tachycardic, 18 beats per minute since vomit. Mr Johnson says it's not an innocent coincidence that Child G deteriorated one hour after being fed by Letby. Letby replies, yes, it is. Letby is asked to look at her defence statement. It included, quote, I did not shout for help as I did not think it was an emergency. Letby is asked if she sought to minimise what had happened. Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson refers to Dr Peter Fielding's note. It says, Child G had an episode at 10.20 where she had two projectile vomits witnessed by nursing staff. Nurse called for help. Letby denies minimising events, saying this was a self-correcting event for Child G. Letby sent in a text to a work colleague, quote, looked rubbish when I took over this morning and then she vomited at nine and I got her screened. Mr Johnson says that text has two lies in it. Letby accepts she got the time wrong, but says she was not asked about Child G's colour. Mr Johnson says Child G was doing well. Mr Johnson shows a nursing colleague's note from the previous night shift and Letby's nursing note from that day shift. Quote, any suggestion Child G was looking rubbish? Letby says Child G looked pale but didn't use rubbish in clinical notes. Letby denies deliberately falsifying times or making up negative observations for Child G. Letby denies passing off responsibility to other people as suggested by Mr Johnson. Nicholas Johnson. In fact, you are the person causing all these problems. Lucy Letby. No, I am not. Mr Johnson asks Letby to look at her defence statement for the 3.30pm incident for Child G. Letby said she looked round the screen and saw Child G's monitor was off, she was alone and behind the screen. 
Mr Johnson asks if that was correct. Letby replies, yes. The statement adds, Letby wanted the matter of Chalji being left alone on the procedural trolley behind the screens by a doctor brought to attention, but a nursing colleague did not want to report this. Letby agrees it was an innocent coincidence that she was the only nurse in the room at this time. Mr Johnson said Letby had told in evidence that Letby was preoccupied with other babies in the room she was caring for, while doctors tried to cannulate child G behind screens for some time. The court is shown a neonatal schedule for child G and other babies for September the 21st. Letby is recorded as having free duties for other babies in the 90 minutes prior to child G's collapse. One of the free events was for a differently designated nurse's baby in room 2. Letby says that does not mean she was not preoccupied with other babies and may have been dealing with their families or other duties. Letby is asked about the event and her looking behind the screen, that child G was, quote, dusky, blue and not breathing. Letby is asked if that was true. She replies, yes. Letby agrees she picked child G up, put her in a cot and neopuffed her. She says the neopuff equipment would not stretch to the trolley. A nursing colleague froze and went to get a separate nursing colleague. Letby said in evidence she was very concerned by what had happened. Mr Johnson says one thing not mentioned in the defence statement was Letby moving child G from the trolley to the cot. He asks why Letby had not mentioned that. Letby says she cannot say. Mr Johnson says Letby took advantage of a situation that presented itself. Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson says when the cannulation process was taking place, Letby must have been in the room. Letby says she would not have been there all the time. One of the charts is shown for a baby that Letby was looking after, with the chart requiring readings that took about five minutes to make. Letby says she was in and out of the nursery all day, on activities that did not require being cotside. She says she does not recall at any point being told by doctors they had finished with the cannulation process for child G. Letby says it would have been up to the doctors to remove the screens and make sure child G was safely back in her cot following the cannulation. Mr Johnson moves on to the case of child H. Letby says she does recall child H due to the chest drains that were in place. Letby said chest drains had to be couriered from Arrow Park Hospital it was unacceptable that they didn't have sufficient supplies at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Mr Johnson asks if Letby filled in a Datix form for that. Letby says she does not recall. Letby is asked about the text message she sent to Yvonne Griffiths on September 26, 2015, which said, quote, Thank you, that's really nice to hear, as I gather you are aware of some of the not-so-positive comments that have been made recently regarding my role, which I have found quite upsetting. Our job is a pleasure to do and just hope I do my best for the babies and their family. The court hears this was with regard to Letby and colleague Shelley Tomlins being allocated shifts in room one over other nurses who needed the experience. Letby says she cannot recall which nurses specifically had been making those comments, but they were band six nurses. Letby agrees this message followed events for child H. Mr Johnson refers to the staffing rotor for September the 25th and 26th. Letby says it was not the night shift who were making the comments. Mr Johnson asks if it was the day shift, why did they allocate child H to Letby? Letby replies the comments had come in recent days prior to this. Letby, in her defence statement, questioned how familiar the doctors were with chest drains. Letby, when questioned on this, says this would be non-consultants. In her defence statement, Letby said she could not recall the specific details of child H's collapses. Letby is asked to refer to her defence statement in which she said her memory for both nights when child H collapsed merged into one. Letby added she was also looking after a severely disabled baby. Letby now accepts the disabled baby was born later in the shift. Letby tells the court staffing levels were not a contributory factor in child H's collapses. Letby said she would question whether the chest drains were securely put in for child H as a potential contributory factor in child H's collapses. Nicholas Johnson KC is continuing to cross-examine Lucy Letby on child H. Letby is asked if staffing issues contributed to child H's collapse. She says no, 
but believes the management of the chest drains was a contributory factor. Lucy Letby. I believe it has been accepted throughout the trial that there were issues with the chest drains. Letby said the location of the chest drains on Child H may have been a factor and that Child H's pneumophoruses were not treated correctly due to a lack of experience and nobody seemed particularly confident on managing the number of chest drains. She says that was down to multiple doctors. Asked who those would be, Letby said that would include Dr Ravi Jayram, Dr David Harkness, Dr John Gibbs and Dr Alison Ventress. Letby says she had dealt with chest drains in Liverpool but not at the Countess of Chester Hospital. She says she did not have much experience and had a nursing colleague to assist her in the care of child H. Letby is asked about the time between 8pm and 2am on September 25th, 26th. She says she cannot recall specifically the assistance she had from a nursing colleague that night but she was there on and off and gave me a lot of verbal advice that night in the management of Child H's chest drains and on baptism after the collapse of Child H. Mr Johnson reads from Child H's father's statement. He refers to being at the unit until about midnight and was woken up from home in the early hours. Letby's nursing note is shown to the court. It includes times two chest drains in situ at start of shift, intermittently swinging. Serous fluid plus plus accumulating. 2330 bradycardia and desaturation requiring Neopuff in 100% to recover. 10 mil air aspirated from chest drain by Reg Ventress. Inserted a third chest drain. Mr Johnson says Letby misrepresented the time of this event. Letby tells the court she would have got that time from her notes written at the time. An intensive care chart is shown to the court. It includes, for 2200 hours, 2210 DSAT, SHO present, serous fluid plus plus, times 2 drain. Letby says she cannot recall which SHO was on duty that night. Mr Johnson says the SHO on duty was Jessica Scott and she has not recorded a note saying she was present at that time. Another note, quote, Brady DSAT 2330, 10 mil aspirated from drain. Other details are plus clear in the OP row and plus small blood stained in the suction ET row. Mr Johnson says this is another child producing blood in Letby's care. Letby says this blood has likely come from the ET tube in the lungs. She denies moving it around to destabilise child H. Letby accepts that a 52% desaturation is a potentially serious event. She says, I don't agree, to the suggestions she has cooked the books in her nursing notes. She denies falsifying notes for Child H by giving the impression Child H was deteriorating prior to the collapse. Letby is asked why the 52% desaturation is not in her nursing note. She replies, not every single thing gets written down. That is an error on my part. Letby says that SHO was present from that earlier desaturation. Letby denies writing in the intensive care chart after Child H's collapse. Nicholas Johnson. You're making this up as you go along, aren't you? Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson says Child H's father's statement, which was agreed evidence, did not mention a collapse or an SHO being present. Letby, however, denies lying. Dr Alison Ventress records a note for Child H timed at 11.50pm. It begins, quote, several episodes of desaturation in past two hours. First one after gas taken became agitated. Mr Johnson says Letby told this information to Dr Ventress. Letby says she did not know if she told her this information. She may have been present in the room. Dr Ventress adds, further episodes, no change in heart rate recovered with bagging. Oxygen requirement down to 30% between episodes. Letby denies trying it on or falsely creating the impression to Dr Ventress that Child H had been having problems for a couple of hours. Mr Johnson says the notes on the observation chart and Letby's nursing notes don't match. Mr Johnson asks if this is an innocent coincidence and Letby agrees. An observation chart for Child H is shown for September 25th, 26th. Letby is asked if the results show any concern up to midnight. Letby replies, 
This, the observations taken, reflects that specific moment in time and says that chart shows no concerns with all readings in the normal range. Dr Ventress added in her 11.50pm note, second chest drain advanced back into 4cm as was almost out, done prior to chest x-ray. Letby is asked why she had not noticed that. Letby says medical staff put drains in and managing them was not part of her nursing role. She accepts she knew chest drains were more secure when stitched in rather than taped in. She says she was checking the chest drains. She denies removing the chest drain to cause a desaturation just after Child H's father left. Mr Johnson asks about Letby's error, as mentioned in her evidence, about the timing of the blood transfusion being completed. Letby said on May 15th, the 0200 blood transfusion completed should read 3am. Letby says she has miswritten it from looking at the charts. A blood infusion therapy chart is shown in Letby's writing, which has in the time-ended column what appears to be 0205 corrected to 0305. Nicholas Johnson. The same mistake in two different places. What happened after 0305? Lucy Letby. I don't recall. Really? Child H had a cardiac arrest. Letby is asked how on earth she made the 0205 error. Letby replies, because we're human people, we make mistakes. Letby says the error is mine on the nursing notes, but the timings were otherwise accurate. Letby says she cannot remember Child H's father being present. The father recalled mottling running out of her skin towards her fingers. Letby says she agrees there was mottling on Child H's skin, but not that it was moving. A blood gas chart for September 26th is shown to the court for child H. Letby agrees the reading at 6.44am is a good blood gas reading. Mr Johnson says child H had had a miraculous recovery. Letby replies, yes. Nicholas Johnson, were you pleased? Of course I was pleased. Or were you frustrated that you had failed in your attempt to kill her? No. The second event is being discussed. For the night of September 26th, 27th, Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for two babies in room two. Nurse Christopher Booth was the designated nurse for child G in room two, and Nurse Shelley Tomlins was the designated nurse for child H in room one. Elizabeth Marshall is the designated nurse for four babies in room three, including child I. The court hears a seriously ill baby was brought into the unit during the night. The court hears Letby in her evidence to defence on May 15th said she did not have much to do with child H on the night shift. Letby said she was reliant on medical notes as she did not recall with any great detail that night for child H. Dr Matthew Neem was the registrar that night with Dr Jessica Scott the night SHO. Letby accepts she had got confused in her defence statement between the events of this night and the previous one. She rules out staffing levels as a contribution in Child H's deterioration. She says she cannot comment on medical incompetencies as she was not Child H's designated nurse and was not present for much of the shift, and rules out a doctor or nurse making mistakes. Letby is asked if she was involved in an event timed at 9.15pm for Child H, who had a desaturation and bradycardia. Letby said she did not remember. Dr Neem, in evidence, said, quote, ETT removed by nursing staff, and that nurse was Letby alone. Lucy Letby replies, well, I don't have any recollection of that. A text is shown from Letby to a colleague at 9.51pm, quote, I've been helping Shelley, so Lee's still involved but haven't got the responsibility. Letby says she does not agree she would have removed an ET tube by herself. The neonatal schedule shown for 9 to 10 p.m. shows no duties for child H, for which Letby has been named as the nurse. Letby is asked about what she had been helping Shelley with, as per her text message. She says she had been helping with child H. She denies taking an opportunity to sabotage child H. Nurse Shelley Tomlin's note for 9.45 p.m. is shown. The court is shown Nurse Tomlin's note for that shift, which include, quote, Around 2030, Child H had profound DSAT and Brady. 
Air entry no longer heard and capnography negative, therefore ETT removed and doctors crash bleeped. New ETT sighted on second attempt. Copious secretions obtained via ETT and orally blood stained. 2145 desaturation to 40% despite good air entry and positive capnography. ETT suctioned quickly with thick blood stained secretions noted. Child H recovered quickly after. Let B denies altering Child H's ET tube to cause bleeding. Mr Johnson asks if Letby was bored with the children she was looking after in room 2 prior to Child H's collapse. Letby replies, no. She denies she had time on her hands. At 12.45am on September 27th, Letby is recorded as liking a post on Facebook. At 12.46am, she liked a Facebook photo posted by a colleague. Letby says she may have been on her break at this point. Mr Johnson says Letby was involved in a fluid balance chart for one of her designated babies around that time. Letby replies, yes, at 1am. Child H's father's statement is read to the court, in which he said quite late on Saturday, September 26th, he went to rest and was woken up shortly afterwards to get to Child H's bedside. Letby denies using the time the father was away as an opportunity to attack Child H. Lucy Letby. No, I've never attacked any child. Letby says she couldn't say if she was covering for Shelley Tomlins at 1am. An observation chart is shown for child age for September 26th, 27th. Hourly observations are made between 8pm and 4am, except for 1am. Crash call bleep data is made at 1.04am and 1.06am for child H. Mr Johnson says Dr Neem gave evidence to say when he arrived, Letby was present. Nicholas Johnson. Is that right? Lucy Letby. I can't say, from memory. You were there, weren't you? I can't say exactly where I was, from memory. Letby denies making an alibi at 1am for the fluid balance chart for her designated baby. Lucy Letby. That's me giving cares to the baby I was allocated. Nurse Shelley Tomlin's record, written at 3.49am for the 3.30am desaturation, quote, 0330, profound desaturation to 60s, again requiring neopuffing with no known cause for desat. Copious amounts of secretions yielded orally, pink tinged. Small amount of ET secretions gained, again pink tinged. Heart rate mainly normal during desat, recovered slowly. Letby denies interfering with Child H's ET tube. Letby says she is helping Shelley Tomlins after the desaturation. Nicholas Johnson. Why is it always you that ends up in nursery room one? Lucy Letby. I don't agree it's always me. Mr Johnson moves on to the case of Child I. Letby agrees she remembers Child I very well. Mr Johnson says this is another case where you falsified her records. Letby is asked to look at her defence statement. She said child eye's stomach, quote, bloated regularly and all the nursing staff were aware of it. Letby said, quote, nothing was ever done about the concerns with child eye's bowel. Letby said she was one of those raising concerns that she was not getting the treatment she needed. The defence statement adds Letby did recall one handover to nurse Bernadette Butterworth that child eye desaturated and became apneic and she assisted in care thereafter. Letby, when asked, rules out staffing levels as a problem that led to Child Eye's deterioration on September 30th. For September 30th, Letby was looking after Child Eye and two other babies in room 3 on her long day shift. Letby rules out medical incompetencies or mistakes made by medical staff that led to Child Eye's collapse on September 30th. Letby is asked to look at Child Eye's medical records from September 26th to 29th and observations early on Letby's shift on September 30th. Letby agrees Child Eye was stable at this time. A temperature of 36.1C is recorded for Child Eye at 11am and the hot cot temperature was turned up. Letby denies by this time she had fallen out with medical colleagues Ashley Hudson, Melanie Taylor and one other. The ward round posted a positive picture for Child Eye on September 30th. Let B agrees. 
child eye was due her immunisations, as noted on the ward round. Mr Johnson says this positive picture was similar to child G, when child G was about to have her immunisations. Mr Johnson asked what became an obstacle to that. Letby replies it was child eye vomiting and having to be transferred to room 1. A feeding chart is shown for child eye for September 30th. Mum fed and gave cares at 10am. The note is signed by Letby. At 1pm, a 35ml feed was given via the NG tube, which had a 5ml aspirate. Letby says the 5ml aspirate is a very minimal amount. At 4pm, a further 35ml feed is given via the NG tube. On both occasions, child eye was asleep. At 4.30pm, quote, large vomit plus apnea. N1 transfer to nursery 1. Letby is asked about child eye's mother's routine. Letby says she cannot call specifically. She adds the mother would visit the unit regularly. Mr Johnson suggests Letby knew the family so well through the frequent visits that she got to know their routine when they would be in and out of the unit. Letby replies, I don't agree. Dr Lisa Beebe's notes shows she was asked to review child eye due to a low temperature. The note adds, quote, Mum reports low temperature has been happening over past few days. The note concludes, monitor closely. If further concerns for sepsis, screen but appears clinically well at present. Letby says she does not recall the conversation. She does not recall, as the prosecution suggests, telling the doctor one concern low temperature and the mother another of the abdomen. She denies providing a cover and says she did not monitor child eye closely as noted on the doctor's plan. Letby says she first monitored child eye's vital signs at 3pm. She said the concern raised with the doctor was child eye having a low temperature and she had adjusted that by raising the hot cot temperature. Mr Johnson suggests that monitor closely would mean more observations. Letby replies, I disagree. Letby is asked how long the 1pm 35ml feed with thickener as listed on the chart would take to administer. She agrees it would take roughly 15 minutes. Letby's nursing note, written at 1.36pm, is shown to the court. Quote, 3 times 8 feeds EBM, 2 bottles to 1 NG tube, abdomen appears full and slightly distended, soft to touch, child eye straining plus plus. Bowels have been opened. Mum feels it is more distended to yesterday and that child eye is quiet. Appears generally pale. Doctors asked to review to continue with current plan. Letby says, we monitor all our babies closely. In response to why Dr Beeb has said monitor closely instead of do what you normally do. Mr Johnson, this is yet another example of you writing nursing notes for something that didn't happen. Lucy Letby, I don't agree. Letby denies cooking the notes to show child eye was deteriorating prior to her collapse. An observation chart for child eye is shown for September 30th. Hourly observations are made for 10am to 1pm and 3pm to the rest of the day. Letby says there is no reason why the 2pm observation is not made. Letby is asked which doctor reviewed child eye at 3pm. Letby names one doctor and believes it was the one doctor who reviewed. Mr Johnson says there is no medical note in relation to this. Letby, however, denies making it up. Mr Johnson asks Letby why the bottle bottle NGT feed system is interrupted by bottle NGT NGT. Letby says the 4pm second NGT feed was as child eye was asleep. Letby denies falsely recording notes for when child eye had bowel movements during the day. Mr Johnson says a doctor's notes does not note a prior examination. Letby denies making up the examination in her notes. She adds, quote, just because it's not there doesn't mean it didn't take place. Mr Johnson says Letby is very keen to raise doctor's mistakes with the likes of Dr Harkness and Dr Gibbs, but not in this case. Lucy Letby. I don't believe this was noted at the time. My priority was child eye, not medical notes. You force fed child eye, didn't you? No, I didn't. Letby says child eye did not wake for that feed, so an NGT feed was given as standard practice. 
Mr. Johnson says, despite all the positive signs for child I, she vomited, just like child G, and in both cases, Letby was there. Letby says she does not recall if she was there when child I vomited. A medical report for child I stated, there is splinting of the diaphragm due to bowel distension. Letby denies pumping child I full of milk or air. Letby says, I fed child I the normal dose of milk for her feed. A blood gas chart for child I is shown. The chart had not been noted up by Letby and it was found on a clipboard. It was signed by Bernadette Butterworth for Letby. Letby says the chart was not hidden, it was there for anyone to see. Mr Johnson talks about the 7.30pm event for child I. Letby's notes add, At 19.30 child I became apneic, abdomen distended and firm. Bradycardia and desaturation followed. SHO in attendance and registrar crash called. Air aspirated from NG tube, child I is now very pale and quiet. Let be denies forcing air into child I. Observations for child I for the remainder of September 30th are shown to the court. Bernadette Butterworth's nursing notes state, During handover, child I abdo had become more distended and hard. She had become apneic and bradycardic. Sats had dropped. IPPV given and despite a good seal with Neopuff, there was still no chest movement. Aspirated NGT air plus 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 and two mils of milk obtained. Eventually got chest movement and sats and heart rate normalised. Mr Johnson talks about the second event for child I, which was on the night of October 12th-13th when Letby said she was standing in the doorway when she could see child I looked pale and the lights were turned up. Letby says the lighting was on in that room, so child I could be seen prior to the lights being turned up. Letby is asked to look at her defence statement. She recalls Ashley Hudson was quite inexperienced to be looking after child I. Letby said child I required very close monitoring, and adds that, looking back, Ashley had stopped monitoring her when she should have been. Asked to explain where that instruction to monitor child I came from, Letby says it was policy that child I should have been monitored as she come off antibiotics sometime in the previous 48 hours. Letby adds, I'm not saying Ashley made a mistake. Mr Johnson says there had been at least 48 hours since child I had gone off antibiotics before the event occurred. Letby is asked in what way Ashley Hudson was inexperienced. Letby replies, I don't think Ashley had a lot of experience in recognising changes in babies, potentially. Letby says the more experience you have, the more you can detect changes, such as changes in colour in a baby. Letby tells the court she does not recall a reason why she went into room two with Ashley Hudson. In her defence statement, Letby said as they entered the room, they turned the light up on the light dimmer switch and they saw the child looking pale. They went to assist. Child I was gasping and the alarm had not gone off. Let B rules out staffing levels, medical incompetencies or staffing mistakes as a cause of Child I's desaturation on October 12th-13th. A nursing shift rotor is shown for October 12th-13th with Lucy Let B in room 1, designated nurse for one baby. Ashley Hudson was designated nurse for three babies in room 2, including Child G and Child I. Let me repeat, there was no issue with staffing ratios to babies cared for for that night. Let me agrees with the evidence provided by Ashley Hudson, saying that child I was doing well, prospering, and that the level of care had been scaled back. Before the collapse, child I was in air and on bottle feeds. Let me says she has no memory if Ashley Hudson, as said in evidence, left room two to help colleague Laura Eagles in room one. Letby says she had a baby in room 1 and cannot recall who was to look after nursery 2. In evidence, she said she was not the nurse called to room 2. Letby said very quickly she had noticed and saw child I was pale. Letby is asked why she was at room 2. She replies there was nothing sinister about that, that she had been in a chat with a colleague. Nicholas Johnson. The lights were off, weren't they? Letby. I can't say. Letby is asked to look at her police interview. In it, she says she had taken over child I's care as Ashley Hudson had been quite junior. For the observation of child I, she replied the lights were off at night and then they put the lights on, adding she could see child I, quote, 
I noticed that she was pale in the cot. Letby, asked why she had told the jury the lights were never off, says the lights are never off completely, they are turned up. A second police interview has Letby saying, quote, We put the lights on. The lights aren't on in the nursery at night. Asked why she did not refer to a dimmer switch in her police interview, Letby says, I don't know. Nicholas Johnson. Are you trying to massage the evidence by now saying the lights were on low? Letby replies, no. What effect does going from a bright corridor looking into a darkly dimly lit room have on your eyesight? Letby replies, I don't know. You really don't know? No. Everybody knows, don't they? Um, you wouldn't be able to see as well? Mr Johnson says Letby was able to see straight away as she had caused child eyes deterioration. Letby responds, no. The photo of the cot as shown previously is displayed. Do you agree it is accurate? Letby, no, there would be more light visible. The cot would potentially be nearer to the light. I think it was nearer to the workbench than that. Mr Johnson asks how big child eyes hands would be. Letby says they would be small. Mr Johnson says child eye would be almost entirely obscured. Letby replies, just her hands and her face. Nicholas Johnson, which would be covered by that tentacle structure. Letby, not entirely, no. Mr Johnson asks how Letby could spot something Ashley Hudson could not, as mentioned from her police interview. Letby, I had more experience, so I knew what I was looking for. At. What do you mean, looking for? I don't mean it like that. I'm, I'm finding it hard to concentrate. Nicholas Johnson KC for the prosecution continues to cross-examine Lucy Letby in the case of Child Eye. He moves on to the third incident on October the 14th, 2015. Mr Johnson says Letby does not refer to this incident in her statement. Letby, in her evidence, said she did not recall this night. Letby rules out staffing levels, medical incompetence or staffing mistakes as a contributory factor in the collapse of child eye for this incident. The staffing rota for October 13th to 14th, 2015 is shown to the court. Letby is in room 1 as the designated nurse for child eye. Joanne Williams is the designated nurse for two other babies in room 1 that night. Letby is asked to look at her nursing notes for that evening. Mr Johnson says child eye was tolerating handling and tone appears improved according to Letby's notes. The notes add, quote, At 0500, abdomen noted to be more distended and firmer in appearance, with area of discoloration spreading on right-hand side, veins more prominent. Oxygen requirements began to increase, colour became pale, gradually requiring 100% oxygen, blood gases poor as charted. Clear air entry, slightly reduced on left, chest movement reduced, continue to decline. Reintubated at approximately 0700, initially responded well. Abdomen firm and satended. Overall colour pale, x-rays carried out, resuscitation commenced as documented. Night and day staff members present. Lebby says she cannot recall the discoloration now. She does not recall it moved, but it was spreading by getting larger. Nicholas Johnson. Where did you get the time of five o'clock from? Letby. I don't know. I don't know if it's from paper charts or memory. Mr Johnson says if Letby had seen this, she would have escalated it to a doctor. Letby replies, I can't comment on what time the doctor came. Mr Johnson says almost 24 hours earlier, child I was found almost dead, and then this incident happened. He asks what Letby would have done. Letby replies, I would have escalated it to someone senior, like a doctor. Mr Johnson shows the doctor's note, which mentions, quote, abdomen distended and mottled. Letby replies, I can't say specifically what time I asked him to come. The note says he came at 5.55am. Mr Johnson says this would have been an emergency for child I. Letby replies, I don't believe it was an emergency. I believe it showed a decline. Nicholas Johnson. You sabotaged child eye at about six o'clock, didn't you? Letby replies, no. 
A prescription chart shows Dr. Matthew Neem prescribed morphine sulfate for child I, and the infusion was commenced at 5.50am. A fluid chart shows, quote, 0530 abdo distended plus plus in Letby's writing. Letby says by 6am the oxygen requirement had gone up to 100% for child I from 60% at 5am. Letby had written, quote, squeaky for the oxygen level at 5am. Letby tells the court this meant the air entry for child I was not clear. Letby says squeaky air entry is not an emergency. Mr Johnson says there is also expanding discoloration and a distended abdomen. Letby denies copying the word squeaky for the 5am oxygen column from Dr Neem's 5.55am note. Letby says she recalls Dr Neem saying the mottling was unusual. She cannot, however, recall the mottling specifically. A report showed child eye's gaseous distension of the bowel had increased on October 14th since the previous x-ray on October 13th. Child eye had been on a ventilator and nil by mouth. Let be denies injecting air into child eye. Nicholas Johnson. You had inflated child eye with air, hadn't you? Let be replies, no. At 7am, child eye had a significant desaturation. Let be's notes, quote, Reintubated at approximately 0700. Initially responded well. Abdomen firm and distended. Overall colour pale. X-rays carried out. Nicholas Johnson. That is because you were sabotaging her, isn't it? Letby replies, no. Letby says she does not remember the 7am desaturation with any clear detail. Mr Johnson moves on to the final event for Child I, when she died on October the 23rd. Prior to that, Child I had been moved to Arrow Park Hospital before returning to the Countess of Chester Hospital's neonatal unit. Mr Johnson shows Letby observation charts for Child I from the previous day. Letby accepts Child I's observations were stable, save for one slightly raised respiration rate reading. She agrees Child Eye was self-ventilating in air at this point. She accepts Child Eye's abdomen was, the previous day, soft and non-distended. Nicholas Johnson Would you agree that despite free life-threatening events in the previous three weeks that Child Eye appeared to be in a stable condition? Letby replies, yes. For the night of October 22nd to 23rd, Lucy Letby is a designated nurse for a baby in nursery room 2 and 1 in room 3. Ashley Hudson is the designated nurse for child I in room 1 and one other baby. Mr Johnson tells the court the baby in room 2 went to a hospital in Stoke during that night shift. Letby says there were staffing issues, which were not ideal, which were a contributory factor in the treatment of child I following the collapse in that a doctor had to be called away during the event. Letby said, quote, Considering what child I had been through, she was a poorly baby. The doctors were not with her at all times once she deteriorated. Letby adds she believed Ashley Hudson was capable of looking after child I for child I's nursing needs at this stage. The neonatal schedule for that night is shown to the court. Let B sent a message on October 22nd at 8.47pm to a colleague, quote, Unit, nice. Transport on the way to take my baby back to Stoke. Only eight babies. Off duty, not out. Kiss. Mr Johnson says this refers to the baby he mentioned earlier, who was transferred out during that night. The court hears that transfer process, noted as completing at 1am, is not a five-minute process, and takes time and involves family communication. Child I collapsed at 11.57pm. Letby denies falsifying a note for the Stoke transfer baby prior to that at 11pm. The court is shown a nursing note by Ashley Hudson, which the court heard was timed at 10.57pm. Quote, Long line removed due to constant occlusions, neonatal nurse Lucy Letby unable to flush, so Reg Rachel Chang informed. Dr Chang had written for the Stoke transfer baby at 10pm, the baby was safe for transfer. Letby's note for this baby was written at 10.50pm and completed at 10.52. It included a documentation of a long line infusion with a 10% dextrose fluid. Letby has co-signed the document. 
Mr Johnson says, the original 2300 reading has been changed to 2400 by let be. Let be said, the 2300 reading was an error and it was changed to 2400 as the correct time. She adds, quote, the charts are there for everybody to look at. Let be denies falsifying a fluid balance chart for the Stoke transfer baby. Mr Johnson asks if Let be recalls what Ashley Hudson said for the 11.57pm desaturation. He says Miss Hudson gave evidence to say Child Eye was crying, making a noise she had not heard before, different to a cry for hunger. Let me responds, I did not hear that cry at that point. When I entered that nursery, she was quiet and apneic. Let me says, for this event, it was a case where one of the three nurses on duty that night would have had to come in and assist in room one. Letby says she does not recall Ashley Hudson going to call for Child Eye's parents. Letby says there is an error on the IV chart and the time has changed. Nicholas Johnson. Three different mistakes on two different babies? Letby says she does not know who wrote in the different times. Nicholas Johnson. How do those sorts of mistakes happen? Letby says when the unit gets busy we can make errors on the paperwork. Nicholas Johnson. We? Or you? I don't believe it would have been me. We'd have both been there for it. Or is it you altering medical records to put some time between you and a serious event for child I? Letby replies, no. Letby adds, I did not deliberately falsify any paperwork. At 1.06am, child I was crying again, the court hears. Let be recalls Child Eye was crying, but cannot recall being there by the cot side first. She accepts she was in the nursery. Mr Johnson asks if Ashley Hudson was called over by Let be. Let be replies, she might have been in the nursery when I called her, I couldn't say. Let be adds, she could have come in, as her defence statement says, from the other part of the nursery. Let be says she had her hands in the incubator, quote, trying to settle Child Eye. My assessment of child eye at that time was she was hungry and rooting. Nicholas Johnson. You had pumped her full of air. Lucy Letby. No. You were doing your best to kill her. No. Lucy Letby states, I have never injected air into any baby. Nicholas Johnson. Do you remember interrupting child eye's mother? Lucy Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson says Child Eye's mother, in agreed evidence, recalled Letby was, quote, smiling and had talked about how Child Eye had enjoyed her bath. Child Eye had been bathed as part of the bereavement process following her passing. Nicholas Johnson. Why did you say that? Letby replies, it's trying to, in that awful situation, it, it wasn't meant with any malice. We still talk to them and treat them as if they were alive. It wasn't joking or malice, it was trying to reflect on a happier memory. Nicholas Johnson. How can you say such things? Letby replies, she had her first bath when she was alive and that was what she enjoyed. Not the one when she passed away. Nicholas Johnson. How do you know it was her first bath? Letby. Because I was there, we took photographs, it was a big occasion. Mr Johnson asks how many baths Child Eye had in Arrow Park. Letby says she cannot say. Nicholas Johnson. You were getting a thrill out of the grief and despair in that room, weren't you? Letby replies, absolutely not. Mr Johnson moves on to the case of Child J, a baby girl born on October the 31st, 2015. Letby, in her defence statement, said she had never seen a baby with stomas before at the Countess and other doctors were, quote, equally unsure about stomas and the parents were actually more proficient than the Countess staff at dealing with stomas. A handover sheet was taken to Letby's home. The defence statement adds, unintentionally. The night shift rotor for November 26th to 27th is put up. Two Band 4 unit nurses are named in the rotor. Child J was in room 4, the designated nurse was Nicola Dennison, a band 4 nurse also looking after one other baby in room 4. Letby was a designated nurse for two babies in room 3 that night. Letby rules out staffing levels as a contributory factor in Child J's collapse, 
nor medical incompetence, nor staffing mistakes. She says the unit was busy at the time, but was not a contributory factor. She adds she does not know how Child J collapsed. Let B accepts the evidence from Child J's mother that Child J was well and about to go home in a day or two. Let B adds, however, there was an issue with Child J's stoma care, as it had been discussed among the nurses that they had little experience. She adds she does not want to name any names on any specific nurse's lack of experience. Mr Johnson refers to Nicola Dennison's previous experience with stomas, which she said in evidence she had experience of it. Letby says over the years she did not recall any other babies with stomas. Mr Johnson says band 4 nurses, as said by Letby in evidence on May 16th, should not be involved in stoma bag care, as they would be unfamiliar with the procedure. Letby said, quote, The unit was very busy, and we had to use staff where we could. Letby says she was not referring to Nicola Dennison specifically, but the nursing situation overall. Letby says there was not an issue over staffing levels at the time of Child J's collapse. Asked to explain a text message she had sent to a colleague, Letby tells the court, Sometimes I felt nurses would take on roles which I didn't think they were trained enough in. The next message adds, quote, It's shocking, really, that they are willing to take responsibility for things that they have no training or experience on, etc. Don't think they appreciate the potential difficulties. Letby agrees that she believed it was potentially dangerous. Mr Johnson says the impression of the court was that band 4 nurses were not qualified in stoma care, and the hospital was cutting corners by assigning such nurses to those tasks. Letby agrees. The court is shown a document about the duties for special care babies such as Child J, which includes stoma care, Lucy Letby. You need to appreciate the context that the unit was not familiar with stomas. Nicholas Johnson. This nurse was familiar with stomas, wasn't she? In her opinion, yes. Mr Johnson says Letby was deliberately creating the impression to the jury that the care for Child J was deficient. Lucy Letby. I do think that. I don't think that she had a high standard of care. I don't think anyone was overly confident in saying, I know what to do with a stoma. We were led by the parents. Mr Johnson asks why Nicola Dennison was not challenged about this. Letby replies, I can't answer that. Letby, when asked, denies not being happy in nursery room 3 or being happier in nursery room 1. Let B accepts the evidence of Nicola Dennison that babies in room 4 should have the light off overnight as they are due to go home. Mr Johnson says two pairs of events for child J happened, one pair in room 4, one pair in room 2. The room 4 instance happened at 3am and 4.57am, and the room 2 instance happened either side of 7am. Let B accepts this was the case. The court is shown a night shift staffing rotor at the end of the night, in which Child J was in room 2. Letby is asked if she has any memory of the earlier pair of incidents. She says she does not have a recollection. She says from her memory, Child J had a seizure and was moved to room 2. She says she could be mistaken in her memory. The court is shown a apnea Brady fit chart for Child J on November the 27th, Recording events for Child J at 4.40 and 5.03am, recorded by Nurse Nicola Dennison in Nursery 4. The desaturations are recorded by Dr Verhees. Let be recalled when she was called into Room 4, Child J was fitting, not desaturating. Let be accepts that by 6.28am, Child J had been moved to Room 2, as a text message written by her to a colleague had said that was the case. Letby says she cannot recall where she was when she sent the 6.28am message, whether she was in room 2 or not. The message added, quote, Only five staff! Exclamation mark. Mr Johnson. So it was all hands to the pump then, as the twins had been admitted to room 1 as an emergency? Letby replies, Yes. Mr Johnson says all staff would have been concentrated in room 1. Letby replies, Not all, but most, yes. You were not involved in that, were you? Not from memory, no. 
Mr Johnson says the message sent at 6.31am would have meant Letby would not have been in room 1. Letby agrees. Letby says Mary Griffiths would not have been in room 1 as she was not an intensive treatment unit trained nurse. She denies she would have been the last nurse in room 2. Letby accepts from looking at the neonatal schedule she would have been in room 2 when the emergency twins were admitted to room 1. Nicholas Johnson there would have been a lot of distractions, wouldn't there? Let be. I don't know what you're implying. The medical staff would have their attention focused on the twins and any help that could be spared would have gone on the twins. Do you accept that a lot of help was needed? Let be replies, it would be normal practice to get in the consultant when we only had the registrar. Yes. Dr Gibbs arrives at 6.34am earlier than normal for his shift to assist. The last message Letby sent to her colleague was at 6.49am. The colleague sent three messages which were not replied to in the following minutes. Nicholas Johnson. That's because you were in nursery room 2 sabotaging a child, weren't you? Letby replies, no, I wasn't. Letby accepts that on the neonatal schedule. She is not recorded doing anything in the half hour prior to child J's collapse at 6.56am. Mr Johnson refers to Dr John Gibbs' notes of, quote, sudden DSATs to unrecordable levels at 6.56 and at 7.24 bradycardia, both associated with clenching of hands, stiff limbs and on the second occasion, eyes deviated to the left. Nicholas Johnson, this was your doing. Letby replies, no, it wasn't. Lebby accepts it was an emergency situation and Dr Gibbs had to be called away from room 1 to child J in room 2. You took your opportunity when all resources at the NNU were concentrated on the twins who had been admitted as an emergency. Lebby responds, no. Lebby accepts evidence had been heard saying there was no known cause for child J's deterioration. Lebby had care of child J the following night which the court is shown from Letby's notes for that night, nothing happened. Mr Johnson moves on to the case of Child K, born on February the 17th, 2016. Letby said in her defence statement she did not recall the events of February the 17th and did not recall saying to Dr Ravi Jayram that Child K had just started deteriorating. She said she had done nothing to interfere with Child K's tube or the alarm. She added the Countess neonatal unit was not capable, giving its staffing levels of looking after a baby of child K's gestational age. Letby tells the court she has no memory of such a conversation with Dr Jram. She says it is difficult to dispute Dr Jram's recollection of the event as she had no memory of it. She denies she has changed her version of events since starting to give evidence. Letby is asked if she understands the reason why Child K was born at the Countess. Letby replies, yes. Mr Johnson tells the court it was deemed too risky to transfer Child K and her mother to another hospital at that stage and that was why Child K was born at the Countess. Lucy Letby, I don't know why more effort was not made to find a bed for her elsewhere. Nicholas Johnson, you have persistently given the impression that the Countess has taken on babies it is not able to look after and that is why they collapse. Letby replies, yes. Is that the reason you said to the jury you didn't understand why Child K was born at the Countess? Letby replies, I don't understand why she was born at the Countess. Is it to bolster your defence? No, I understand why she was born there but I don't necessarily agree with the decision to have her born there. Letby says she does not recall the latter two desaturations for child K and does not accept Dr J Ram's evidence in the first desaturation. Mr Johnson says he will deal with these in a different order than chronologically. He will cross-examine on the second desaturation first. Letby says she does not know what happened to child K, so does not cite staffing levels as a contributory factor in child K's desaturations. She says she feels potentially that ET tubes were not secured for child K. The second desaturation occurred at 6.10 to 6.15am on February the 17th, 2016. 
The court hears a note on Child K's birth and assessment was typed up by Let's Be on a computer from 6.04 to 6.10am. The note would have been taken from paper charts taken by the cot side, Nicholas Johnson. You were at Child K's cot side a minute or two before she desaturated, weren't you? Let me says she would have got the notes from the cot side at some point prior to her typing them up. Mr Johnson asks Letby about an ET tube document which she had entered at 6.10am on February 17th 2016. Child K desaturated at 6.15am. Letby says she has no memory of being at Child K's cot side. Letby agrees Child K had been on morphine and would have been well sedated. Nicholas Johnson. And yet the tube slipped again at 6.15am just after you had been with her. Letby responds, I can't say that I was physically with her, no. Letby says the notes she would have obtained for Child K were at the end of the bed and she has no recollection of being physically with Child K at the cot side. Mr Johnson asked about the 7.25 to 7.30am desaturation. Letby says she has no memory of it. Letby says she cannot recall any intervention regarding Child K at that point. Mr Johnson says one of Letby's colleagues was called to the nursery. Nicholas Johnson. What were you doing in nursery room 1 at 7.30am? Letby replies, I can't answer that. I don't have any recollection of it. The neonatal review is shown for February the 17th, 2016. Letby's duties include tending to her designated baby in room 2 at 7am. Mr Johnson says there was no reason for Letby to be in room 1 at 730 Letby replies, there can be many reasons. Mr Johnson says Letby was sabotaging Child K yet again, weren't you? Letby replies, no. Letby says she cannot say if Child K moved her ET tube more than once. Quote, I don't have independent memory of the tube slipping. Letby is asked to look at her police interviews for Child K. Within there, Letby said she had believed Child K's tube had slipped at an earlier point. Letby denies dislodging Child K's tube. Asked if she disputes her colleague's recollection of Child K's desaturation, Letby says she cannot recall. Mr Johnson moves to the 3.50am desaturation, the first of three desaturations for Child K. Letby agrees Joanne Williams was Child K's designated nurse. She agrees Joanne Williams left Child K before the 3.50am desaturation. She accepts that that nurse left at 3.47am. Letby says she cannot recall Dr Ravi Jayram's whereabouts at this point. A note from the transport team at 3.41am is shown to the court. Quote, called Dr Jayram back with the above plan and he was agreeable totally with all the above. Letby accepts that if this note is accurate, Dr Jayram would have been around the nursing station at this time. Letby accepts that Joanne Williams would have asked someone to babysit Child K in her temporary absence from the nursery. Asked if she disputes it was her to babysit Child K, she replied, quote, I have no memory of that. Letby says she has no memory of Dr Ravi Jayram's account of him walking into the unit and seeing her standing over Child K's cot side or that Child K was desaturating or that Child K's ET tube was displaced. Letby denies trying to kill Child K. Lucy Letby is shown a copy of her 2019 police interview, specifically police talking through Dr Ravi Jayram's account of events from that night. That was the evidence he had given in the trial, that he had felt uncomfortable with Letby being in nursery room 1 and entered and saw Letby. Letby, in police interview, said she didn't remember the event. Mr Johnson suggests Letby is lying. Letby denies this. Letby denied in police interview dislodging the tube. Mr Johnson says Letby had earlier said the event, quote, didn't happen. Letby replies, I don't believe it did happen, but I have no direct memory of it. Letby tells the court it was standard practice at the Countess of Chester Hospital's neonatal unit to wait a few seconds, 10 to 20, to see if a baby self-corrected during a desaturation. Nicholas Johnson. 30 seconds? Letby replies, I can't say. You are lying, aren't you? No. Because you were trying to kill Child K. 
No. The nursing notes for Joanne Williams recorded, quote, large amount blood-stained oral secretions for child K. Lebby says she did not believe she gave Joanne Williams that information. Nicholas Johnson. Did you ever see child K's parents? Lebby replies, I can't recall. Did you ever meet them? I can't recall. Then why did you search for them on Facebook on April 20th, 2018? Lebby replies, because I have thought of the babies on the unit over the years and I do look back at them. You have a very good memory for names. Lebby replies, yes. Her name didn't appear on the handover sheet, did it? Lebby responds, I can't say. Mr Johnson says child K had been born earlier that day and handed over to the care of Melanie Taylor and child K was transferred out of the hospital. Nicholas Johnson. How can you remember that name of child K? Let be. I can't. Nicholas Johnson. Can't or won't? Let be. I can't. What was the significance of April the 20th, 2018? Let be replies, I can't recall. Do you remember the answer you gave to your counsel on May the 16th? Letby responds, no. Mr Johnson says Letby said you look back on all the babies you care for. Letby says it was taken out of context and she played a part in child K's care via the morphine infusion. Mr Johnson moves on to the case of child F, the first of the two babies the prosecution say let be poisoned with insulin. Child L is the other child allegedly poisoned by Let B. Mr Johnson previously told the court the cases of child F and L would be part of the cross-examination process together. Let B accepts the insulin readings which were shown for child F, the insulin and insulin C peptide numbers. The jury have heard the blood sample showed an extremely high level of insulin and a very low C peptide level in child F which a medical expert said only had one explanation, that being that the child received insulin from some outside source. Letby tells Mr Johnson that she accepts the insulin and C-peptide levels detected in the blood of child F. Mr Johnson asks if Miss Letby agrees that someone targeted child F and injected insulin into his feed bag. She says, quote, she can't answer that, but says, I accept that he was given insulin at some point, yes. The nursing staff rotor for August 4th to 5th is shown to the court. Child F is in room 2 with Letby's colleague, the designated nurse. Letby was designated nurse for another baby. Letby says she cannot say how the insulin got in Child F. So, quote, I don't think I can answer if staffing levels played a part in the poisoning of Child F. Mr Johnson says Letby was very keen to ask police about the TPN bag said to have had insulin in it. Letby replies because I was being accused of placing insulin in the bag. I thought someone would have checked the fluids. I wanted them to check the bag, yes. I thought it would have been standard practice on the unit. Mr Johnson says Letby had not been questioned about Child F and Child L in 2018, but was questioned about it in the following interviews. In it, Letby asked police about the nutrition bag said to have had insulin in. Nicholas Johnson. You knew very well the bags wouldn't have been kept, didn't you? Letby replies, no. Letby had said to police if there had been concerns over the bags, they would have been kept. Nicholas Johnson, you knew no concern had been expressed, didn't you? Letby replies, I didn't know no concern had been expressed at the time of this interview, no. Police had asked why Letby had asked about the nutrition bags. Letby had said to police there may, quote, have been an issue with something else. Letby tells the court the issue may have been insulin coming from outside the unit. She says at that point it was not known where the insulin had come from and it was not known if it was in the bags. Letby says she does not recall there were concerns for child F's blood sugar level in her police interview in 2019. Mr Johnson, however, says she was aware of it at the time. Text messages are shown to the court with Letby messaging a colleague about a low blood sugar reading. Nicholas Johnson. Had you seen something like this before? Babies having loads of dextrose and still having low blood sugars? Letby replies, yes. Nicholas Johnson, you were trying to place it as natural causes. Letby replies, I don't think I was trying to provide an explanation. Letby's message is shown to the court. 
wonder if he has an endocrine problem then. Mr Johnson asks, does that mean natural causes? Lebby replies, yes. Mr Johnson asks about the security of nutrition bags in the fridge under lock and key. He says they are not safe from someone with a key who can inject a tiny amount of insulin into the bag. Lebby replies, the bags are sealed and you would have to break the seal to do that. Mr Johnson asks if that would prevent someone from the previous shift from inserting insulin into the bag. Lebby replies, I can't say that as I wouldn't put insulin into a TPN bag. Mr Johnson says the prescribed bag must have been tampered with between 4pm on August the 4th and 1am on August 5th. The replacement bag was a generic one. Mr Johnson describes how the insulin could be administered after the bag has been delivered to the ward. One method is after the cellophane wrap has been removed, to which he says that would mean there would be very few candidates who could have done that. Nicholas Johnson. Why would you not put insulin into bags? Let be. Because that would go against all standard practice. It is highly dangerous. Letby replies, yes. Life-threatening to a child. Letby replies, yes. Something that would never cross the minds of medical staff. Lucy Letby. At the time, no. Letby says she cannot answer if child F was deliberately poisoned, as she does not know how the insulin got there, who was there, or why. Mr Johnson asks about the Facebook searches for child E and F's mother, carried out in the months after August 4th, 2015. Letby says she got on well with the mother at the time, that she thought about child E often, and wanted to see how child F was doing. Mr Johnson moves to the second insulin case for child L, who was a twin to child M. Letby's defence statement said she had done nothing wrong and had not deliberately harmed either twin. Letby said in her defence statement the unit was exceptionally busy on April 9th 2016, the day after child L and child M had been born. Letby said at the time she could not understand child L's insulin levels and could not understand why there was not an investigation done at the time. Letby denies using the hyperglycemic pathway not being followed as an opportunity to attack child L. Letby says she accepts someone put insulin into the dextrose solution for child L and accepts there would be no reason for doing this and it would be quote highly dangerous. Letby accepts the blood results prove insulin was placed in the dextrose solution. Professor Hindmarsh had previously given evidence to say insulin had been administered between midnight and 9.30am on April 9th. Nicholas Johnson, do you accept that? Letby replies, yes. Mr Johnson says the insulin administered to child L was a quote targeted attack as the dextrose bag had been in place since noon on April 8th. Quote, it follows that insulin was administered while the dextrose bag was hanging, doesn't it? Letby responds, I don't know. Mr Johnson talked through the process and repeats that from evidence the bag must have been in place when insulin was administered. Letby replies, if that's what the expert suggests, yes. Nicholas Johnson, it follows that it was a targeted attack. Letby replies, I can't answer that. Mr Johnson says the only two staff members on duty for both days when Child F and Child L were poisoned with insulin were Letby and Belinda Simcock. A staffing rotor for the April 9th day shift is shown to the court. Child L and Child M are in room 1 with designated nurse Mary Griffith. Letby is designated nurse for two other babies in room 1. Belinda Simcock is the designated nurse for three babies in room 3. Four babies are in room two, and four babies are in room four. The neonatal schedule for April 9th is shown. Mr Johnson says it is to show what Lucy Letby was doing between 9 and 9.30am. The schedule shows Letby was a co-signer for medication for one baby in room two, and giving a feed to her designated baby in room one. Letby was the co-signer for medication for a room one designated baby at around 9.10am. Mr Johnson says a series of prescriptions for three different babies at 9.25 to 9.20am, co-signed by a nursery nurse and Mary Griffith, gave Letby the opportunity to administer the insulin for child L. Letby replies, no, I don't know how the insulin got there. Mr Johnson says it has already been established that insulin was administered on the unit, on the bag that was connected to child L throughout that time. 
Nicholas Johnson. This was a targeted attack, wasn't it? Let be pauses. What do you say? Let be replies, not by me it wasn't. Let be says she can only answer for herself in relation to the accusation by Mr Johnson that the insulin poisoning for child F and child L can only be you or Belinda Simcock. Mr Johnson says despite the fact the bag was changed at noon on April 9th, the insulin kept being administered to child L. Letby replies, yes. Mr Johnson says we know that because the blood sample taken to the lab was taken at 3.45pm and contained insulin. Letby replies, I can't recall. Mr Johnson says child L was targeted with a second bag of insulin. Letby responds, I'd have to be guided by the evidence, the expert evidence. Mr Johnson says a third bag is hung up at 4.30pm. The hyperglycemia continued and Letby agrees. The fourth bag hung up the following day when you Letby were not working was put up and the hypoglycemia gradually resolved. Letby agrees. Mr Johnson says the reason for the hypoglycemia was that someone had poisoned child L through at least two bags of insulin. Letby responds, yes, Nicholas Johnson. And that was you, wasn't it? Letby replies, no. Nicholas Johnson KC is continuing to cross-examine Lucy Letby, turning to the case of child M. Letby confirms there is nothing she wishes to change in her evidence given in cross-examination so far. Mr Johnson says for child M, Letby, in her defence statement, said child M was, quote, slotted into a space in nursery room one, which was full. Child M was apneic and it was not known if he had had a desaturation. A crash call was put out and child M was turned around in the incubator by a nursing colleague to get him onto a monitor. Let be added, she did not notice any skin colour changes in child M at the time. Let be said in her statement she had written up notes on child M's resuscitation on a paper towel which ended up in her pocket and were taken home with her. Letby tells the court it would have been used to write up nursing notes. Letby says child L and child M stood out in her mind at the time as they were the first twins delivered where she was the allocated nurse. Letby agrees child M was not an intensive care baby and had been doing well. Asked if staffing levels were a contributory factor in child M's collapse, Letby replies that the unit was very stretched during the April 9th shift. Asked to clarify by Mr Johnson, she says it was a potential factor. Letby tells the court child M had been in a corner unit in a full nursery, and as nursing and medical staff were very stretched that day, staffing was not at a great level. Letby says she does not know what caused child M's collapse, so rules out a mistake by staff. She says it is hard to say if staff competencies were a factor in the collapse. Mr Johnson says Dr Ravi Jayram observed skin colour changes in child M at the time of the collapse. He says, quote, because child M was darker skinned, it was more obvious. He said child M was pale with pink blotches on the torso that would appear and disappear. He said he noted the most obvious patches on the abdomen. Quote, I noted them when I got there at the start of the resuscitation. He added he had only seen that once before, in the case of child A. Let me responds, I did not see anything like that. No. Let me is asked if the lighting was an issue in nursery room one. Let me had told police in interview the lighting was quote poor in room one. Child M was in a darker corner of the nursery, let me tells the court. She added to police quote, I do remember his colour being harder to assess as he was an Asian baby. Letby tells the court the colour change, if any, was more difficult for her to see. Mr Johnson asks why it was necessary for child M to be in the corner of room 1 if there were four babies in there with a capacity of four. Letby says there always needs to be an incubator free for emergency admissions in room 1. There were four babies in nursery room 2, three in nursery 3 and four in nursery 4. The court hears the neonatal unit was at effective capacity. The court is shown a clinical note by Dr Anthony Yuko, made at 10.25am on April 9th. Letby says she does not remember if she had any involvement with child M at this time. 
Child M was not Let B's designated baby on this day. A neonatal schedule for Let B on April 9th shows a number of duties Let B had for her designated babies in room 1 between 9 and 9.11am. Let B says one of the designated babies was not a low maintenance baby with complex cannulation issues and was on the ward for a long time. Mr Johnson says Letby has an extraordinary memory for this baby, seven years on, but not for child D who had died. The court is shown a 1.5mm bile-stained aspirate is recorded for child M, following which child M was kneel by mouth and the nasogastric tube was put on free drainage. Mr Johnson says at 3.30pm a 10% dextrose fluid bag is started for child M. Let be agrees with Mr Johnson there is nothing to suggest insulin was put in this bag. Let be says she cannot recall what nurse Mary Griffith was doing at this time. Mr Johnson suggests this was when Miss Griffiths was collecting a blood sample for child L to be quote podded and sent to a laboratory for analysis. Let be says she couldn't say how long it would take to draw up a 12.5% dextrose solution, which in this case was for child L, the twin of child M. Let be agrees it would have been after 3.45pm that the process would have started. Let be denies that it was around 3.45pm that she sabotaged child M. Mr Johnson says the twin's mother said in an agreed evidence statement she had to be taken back to the unit in a wheelchair, having been alerted by Nurse Yvonne Griffiths. And she observed, quote, One of the doctors was pressing child M's chest. Mr Johnson says this is another case where a baby collapsed when the parents were away. Letby says she was with Nurse Mary Griffith at the time of child M's collapse. Letby agrees child M recovered quickly following this collapse. Letby says she did not see skin discoloration and it was not discussed at the time. A colleague had previously told the court Child M's blood gas record sheet was disposed of in a confidential waste bin. Asked how it had ended up under Letby's bed at home, Letby says she has never taken anything out of the confidential waste bin. Letby says she does not know how many blood gas records she has taken home. She says it has been put in her pocket and taken home with a handover sheet. She says she probably put it in her pocket and put it under her bed. Asked why, Letby replies, because I collect paper. Letby says household bills and bank statements would be shredded as they were there and then. Other sheets, such as handover sheets, were not thought about. Dr Yuko's records on the resuscitation for child M are shown to the court. Mr Johnson says the record is meticulous, including six adrenaline doses. Mr Johnson says the data for the resuscitation efforts is on the paper towel that Letby took home, which Mr Johnson says he must have had in his hand at some point. Letby agrees. Mr Johnson says that was in his hand at 8.25pm when he wrote up his notes. Letby said she had to stay late that shift for the handover and writing up medical notes for child M. She denies waiting an hour and a quarter to write up those nursing notes or hanging around to get the note Dr Yuko had when writing up the note. Letby denies rooting around in the bin for the blood gas record for child M to take home. She also denies sabotaging child M. Mr Johnson is now turning to the case of child N, born on June 2nd, 2016. Letby, in her defence statement, says she had never encountered a baby with haemophilia before and no one on the unit seems specifically to know how to care for such a baby. She says she does not believe child N collapsed and it was not accurate to say he had screamed for 30 minutes. She denied causing him any harm. Letby tells the court she does not believe this event for child N was a collapse which required resuscitation. The court is shown a nursing rota for the night shift of June 2nd to 3rd. Letby was designated nurse for two babies in room 4. Child N was in room 1 with one other baby. The designated nurse for both babies was Christopher Booth. Letby rules out staffing levels or incompetence as factors in Child N's collapse. Letby agrees Child N collapsed just after Christopher Booth went on his break. Letby denies she was bored or had time on her hands working in nursery for that shift. She agrees Child N was in good shape at the start of the shift. 
The neonatal schedule for June 2nd to 3rd is shown, with Letby's duties for her two designated babies from 8.30 to 8.38pm. One of the designated babies received a 50 ml NGT feed at 8.30pm as they were asleep. Letby says that feed can take 10 to 15 minutes or so. She says she can't put a definitive number on it. Mr Johnson says other estimates for this kind of feed has taken 20 minutes. Letby replies, I really can't say. Mr Johnson says Letby was texting her friends right through this shift. A sequence of messages is shown to the court. The first sent by Letby is at 7.33pm, followed by 7.35, 7.58, 7.59 and at 8pm, quote, We've got a baby with haemophilia. 8pm, 8.01pm, 8.02, 8.03, 8.04 p.m. quote, Oh, OK, I'll have to Google it later, lol. Don't know much about it. 8.06 p.m., 8.11 p.m. quote, Complex condition. Yeah, 50-50 chance, antenatally. Nicholas Johnson. That is where you got the answer from. Dr. Google. Let me replies, No, 50-50 is something staff would know. Messages are sent by Letby at 8.26pm. Quote, FFS, Mel asking me how to make up 12.5%. Letby said she was shocked that a Band 6 colleague was asking her how to make up such a solution when she could have looked for herself. 8.29pm. Quote, No, I've passed her folder, but now asking if can run via cannula. She needs to look herself. Letby says she was not happy with Mel. Another message is sent from Letby at 8.29pm, 8.31pm, 8.32pm and 8.34pm. Letby is asked how she can feed a baby at 8.30pm when she was also texting. Letby replies, you can't. Letby denies feeding the baby very quickly by putting the plunger on the end. Another message is sent from Letby at 8.38pm, quote, had a strange message from doctor earlier. Mr Johnson asks if Letby's nursing colleague was implying Letby and the doctor were in a relationship. Letby says she does not know. Letby's colleague sent two messages. Quote, did you? Saying what? Go commando? Laughing emoji? Letby is asked by Mr Johnson if she knows what the implication of go commando means. Letby replies, I don't know what was meant. I can't say right now. Nicholas Johnson. Do you think this was an army reference, being from Hereford? Letby replies, I don't know. The messages are sent by Letby at 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.43 p.m. where she states, quote, Do you think he's being odd? 8.44 p.m. Shut up. 8.44 p.m. I don't flirt with him. The text message conversation is shown to the court. It starts with Lucy Letby. Had strange message from colleague earlier. Colleague, did you? Saying what? Letby had replied at 8.39pm with four laughing emojis and then states the following. Asking when I was working next week as wants to talk to me about something. Has a favour to ask? Colleague replies, think he likes you too. Hmm, did you not ask what it was? Letby replies, no, just said when I was working and he said he wants my opinion on something. Hmm. Colleague replies, hmm. Letby then responds, do you think he's being odd? The colleague then replies, Thought as flirty as you. Letby replies, Shut up. The colleague responds, What? Letby replies, I don't flirt with him. The colleague says, OK. Letby then responds, Certainly don't fancy him, haha, just a nice guy. Colleague then replies, OK. Mr Johnson says Letby was texting non-stop in the nursery room. Letby says the feed must have happened at a different time. She says she cannot answer when. She denies pushing it through the feed. Mr Johnson says Child N collapsed at 1am. Christopher Booth noted, One episode whilst I was on my break, whereby infant was crying plus plus and not settling. He became dusky in colour, desaturating to 40s, responded to facial oxygen within 1-2 to two minutes. Crying subsided within approximately 30 minutes and colour returned to normal. Letby tells the court this was not a collapse as facial oxygen was all that was required, not resuscitation. Mr Johnson turns to the second set of events for Child N on June the 15th. The plan was for Child N to go home that week. 
Letby agrees he only needed phototherapy at this stage. A feeding chart is shown for child N, who was being fed mostly expressed breast milk. Child N's mother had visited on the morning of June the 14th and in the evening at 5.15pm. Child N had taken a 60ml bottle feed. Letby agrees with Mr Johnson this was a very good sign. Mr Johnson suggests Letby did something to destabilise child N before the end of her day shift. Letby responds, no, I did not. Letby says it was a coincidence child N was, according to the nursing notes that night, very unsettled early part of night with observations of mottling. Letby is asked about a message sent by a nursing colleague at 5.26am, which said, quote, Baby N screened looks like shit. Letby responded, oh no. Letby denies she saw this as an opportunity to sabotage child N during the day shift. Quote, no, that's not what happened. Letby messaged a doctor colleague at 6.04am on June 15th. Quote, wonder if I'll find my way back into one today then. This is in response to his message at 5.53am, which begins, quote, what a chaotic seven hours. Sorry, I may have filled NICU. Have a good breakfast. I think your day may be busy. Swipe data shows that Letby is on the neonatal unit at 7.12am. Child N desaturated three minutes later and was crying. Letby says she does not recall Child N crying. She says at the time she was in the doorway talking to Jennifer Jones Key, her friend, when the alarm for Child N went off. Letby says it was very busy and a lot of intervention was needed for Child N after he collapsed. She does not cite staffing levels as a contributing factor for the collapse or a mistake by medical staff. Letby says she does not know if issues with intubating Child N were a factor and does not know what caused Child N to collapse. She denies setting up Child N to collapse overnight. Letby, in her defence statement, said she had gone to nursery room 3 not to see Child N specifically, but to speak to Jennifer Jones Key, her friend. She said Child N was blue and not breathing. She shouted for a doctor colleague to assist and Neopuff breathing assistance was applied. Letby is asked about the part where she said, quote, Jennifer and I were at the doorway. Letby says she meant only she was at the doorway and Jennifer Jones Key was in the nursery room. Letby, in a Facebook message to a colleague timed at 7.12pm, said, quote, No repeat today. I've escaped being in one. Back in three. Mr Johnson says Letby had gone into room three, as she knew by that point she was designated babies for that room. Letby says she had gone to see her friend. Letby denies sabotaging child N. Letby agrees it was a serious event which happened within a minute or two of her entering the room. Mr Johnson asks if it was bad luck. Letby replies, yes. Mr Johnson asks Letby when blood was seen orally on child N. Letby replies, the only time definitively she recalled that was at 3pm. She says that is on her memory sitting here now. Mr Johnson says if she had recorded blood observations at the time, will she accept that now? Letby says she would, although it may have been based on what other people had informed her at the time. Mr Johnson says the one who would have informed her would have been the doctor colleague she quote, loved as a friend. Letby's nursing note states, infant transfer to nursery one on handover, mottled, desaturating, requiring neopuff and oxygen. Letby says both she and Jennifer Jones Key had gone over to child N at the time of desaturation. Mr Johnson says Letby was hoping to create the impression on the nursing notes that the problems for child N had happened before the handover. Letby replies, no, I disagree. Letby tells the court she had taken over child N's care from 7.30am. Letby's notes written at 1.53 to 2.10pm adds, quote, Unable to intubate, fresh blood noted in mouth and yielded via suction plus plus. Letby says the 3pm blood observation was the first one she could definitively remember. Mr Johnson says this note is a good hour before that observation. Letby denies child M was bleeding from when she first got involved that day. Letby says she knows there was blood recorded prior to 3pm. Mr Johnson says the doctor colleague recalled in evidence seeing blood before the intubation process at 8am. 
Benjamin Myers KC for the defence rises to say that in cross-examination the doctor colleague did not rule out the possibility that the blood was present after the attempt to intubate. Mr Johnson says there was an attempt to intubate at 8am. Let's be agrees. Let's be also agrees with the observation there was swelling at the back of child M's throat. She says she cannot comment further on what the doctor colleague saw. Let's be recorded in her notes, written at 1.53pm retrospectively, unable to intubate, fresh blood noted in mouth and yielded via suction plus plus. Mr Johnson says the doctors could not see because of the blood. Letby says she cannot say what doctors observed. Letby agrees that evidence from Professor Sally Kinsey ruled out spontaneous haemorrhage for child M at this time. Letby is asked about family communication with child N's parents. A note by Letby at the time, quote, Parents were contacted by SN Butterworth during intubation. Both mobile phones switched off and no answer on landline. Message left. Call returned shortly after and parents were asked to attend, have been present since. Both understandably upset. Agreed evidence said child N's mother had said Lucy Letby had been in contact with them. Letby says, quote, it's a difference in recollection. Mr Johnson says this is agreed evidence. It's the truth. He says Letby's note is a lie. Letby replies, no, it's not. The mother recalled child N, quote, had a bleed and was unwell and said Letby had informed the parents of this. Letby replies, no, I disagree. Nicholas Johnson, but it's agreed evidence. Letby replies, well, I disagree with it now. Mr Johnson says this is another account from a parent which Letby says is untrue. Mr Johnson says Letby has been firing out post-it notes from the doc during the trial but had not raised this issue at the time. Letby replies, I'm not sure. Nicholas Johnson, is the answer no? Letby replies, it's not something I raised with my legal team. I don't want to comment on what's ifs and buts. Mr Johnson says let's be interrupted when the mother of child E and F gave evidence to say she couldn't hear and wanted to leave the courtroom when a doctor colleague began to give evidence. Let me replies, yes, because I felt unwell. Mr Johnson replies, no, no, adding it was because it was her boyfriend who was giving evidence. Let me replies, that's not fair. Mr Myers rises to say the line of questioning is inappropriate and asks for the opportunity to consider the issue raised of a dispute in agreed evidence. Letby adds she did not make the phone call to Child End's parents and denies making false entries in the paperwork. An intensive care chart is shown for Child End on June 15th, saying at 10am, quote, one mil fresh blood. Letby says she cannot say if it was a vomit or aspirate. The note is written in Letby's handwriting. Letby is asked what she did about it. Letby replies, I cannot say, right now. Mr Johnson asks, what would Letby do if fresh blood was observed in child N's mouth? Letby replies, I don't know if it was in the mouth. Letby adds such an observation would have been escalated, but she does not know who to. Mr Johnson says there is no record of it being escalated. Letby agrees there is no written record, but it may have been verbally escalated. She says one mil of fresh blood is not normal, but not a life-threatening event. Mr Johnson says for a baby with haemophilia, it was serious. Letby says it would be a concern and would be escalated. A doctor who was on the ward does not record the bleed during the ward round, the court is told. Mr Johnson says Letby has invented the blood reading for 10am. Letby replies, I disagree. Mr Johnson suggests it was all designed to give an ongoing impression for a child with haemophilia. Letby disagrees. A Facebook message from Letby is sent to a doctor colleague at 11.29am on June 15th. Quote, small amounts of blood from mouth and one mil from NG. Looks like pulmonary bleed on x-ray. Given factor 8, wait and see. Apneas have improved and gas is good. Colour and perfusion still not great. If deteriorates, we'll try to intubate. The x-ray report ruled out a pulmonary bleed. Letby says this report came some time later. Mr Johnson suggests either there wasn't a problem at all, that Letby was making evidence up, 
or let B was causing the problem. Let B disagrees. Mr Johnson says a statement from the parent of child N said the collapse was so serious a priest was offered. Mr Johnson says this collapse must have been the one at 2.50pm. Let be noted, quote, Approximately 14.50, infant became apneic with desaturation to 44%. Fresh blood noted from mouth and three mils blood aspirated from NG tube. Doctors crash called. Nicholas Johnson. What had you done to cause this in child N? Letby replies, I hadn't done anything. Letby denies shoving a foreign object down child N's throat. Letby replies, absolutely not. Nicholas Johnson. It's all your work, isn't it? Letby replies, no it's not, not at all. Letby agrees she was agitated by the need for assistance from Alderhay as she had not known a case before of people coming from another hospital to assist. Nicholas Johnson. Do you remember saying, who are these people? Who are these people? Letby replies, yes, because I had never experienced who these people were. It was a completely new experience. Child N later collapsed once more. She denies using the doctors being in a huddle as an opportunity to try and kill Child N again. Nicholas Johnson KC for the prosecution now moves on to the case of Child O. Let me, in her defence statement, said she did nothing to hurt Child O. She noted a change in Child O's appearance, but it was not dramatic. He had a deterioration and let be noted Child O's abdomen was red and distended. She said she didn't notice a rash on Child O and no one mentioned it. She said the abdomen was very swollen and there was a struggle to get lines in. Let me tells the court one of the lines had tissued. She said one of the doctors had gone out to smoke a cigarette during the time of Child O's resuscitation and when that doctor returned they did not wash their hands. Let be is asked by Mr Johnson if there is anything she wishes to change in her account of evidence so far. This is a question Mr Johnson asks at the start of most sessions during the cross-examination. Let be says there is nothing she wishes to change. Let be agrees with Mr Johnson it was big news to see naturally conceived twins on the unit as it was a rare occurrence. Child O and Child P were two of the three triplets. Messages are shown to the court between Letby and colleague Jennifer Jones Key from June 22nd. Letby confirms when she is back to work, adding, quote, Yep, probably be back in with a bang, lol. Mr Johnson says within 72 hours of that message, two of the triplets were dead and child Q had collapsed. Letby is asked why she was so interested in the triplets. Letby tells the court there was general conversation between staff colleagues as it was something unusual on the unit. She accepts that all went well with the birth and accepts the triplets had been doing well, with Child O being fine. Letby accepts that Child O was doing well on the night shift of June 22nd, 23rd and had been moved off CPAP onto Optiflow breathing support. Letby accepts her colleague Sophie Ellis' description that there was nothing concerning about Child O's presentation. Let B is asked to look at an observation chart for Child O for June 22nd to 23rd. There is a reading which, the court is told, appears to have been changed from 1430 to 1330. Let B says Child O's temperature is a little unstable in the hours prior to 1.30pm on June 23rd, but accepts he was otherwise stable. The court is shown a lab result that there was no bacterial infection in a blood sample taken on June 23rd for Child O. A feeding chart showed Child O was, quote, tolerating his feeds very well. Mr Johnson says, let be agrees. In her legal defence statement, Lucy let be said she didn't believe that a problem with Child O's abdomen was dealt with adequately. Nicholas Johnson KC now asks her what the inadequacy was. Nurse let be says she doesn't know. Mr Johnson asks Letby where the problem is for Child O's abdomen that she had said was not dealt with, as there is no data to show that. Letby says after looking at the data, she does not know what the problem was. Mr Johnson says there is no problem shown in the paperwork. Letby says there was, quote, no formal note made. The court is shown Sophie Ellis's note at 7.32am, quote, Abdo looks full, slightly loopy. Appeared uncomfortable after feed. Reg Maybury reviewed. 
Abdosoft does not appear in any discomfort on examination. To continue to feed, but to monitor. Lepi says the doctor did not formally record it. Lepi accepts the review as carried out at 9am and Chaldo's liver was reviewed, finding no injury. Lepi accepts the liver injury happened on her watch. She says she accepts it happened on her shift, but she does not know how it happened. A shift rotor for June 23rd is shown. Let B was designated nurse for two of the three triplets in room two, child O and child P, plus one other baby. The third triplet was in room one with two other babies. Let B rules out staffing levels as a contributory factor in child O's collapse or death, or staffing mistakes. Let B says Rebecca Morgan was a student nurse on the unit. She accepts that the student nurse would not always be in room two and would sometimes be chatting to parents. Lepi says the two triplets Rebecca was designated for were in the high dependency room, and if Rebecca left the room for a period of time, she would have asked someone to keep an eye on them. A note by Dr. Cook at 9:30 a.m. is shown to the court, which included quote, "No nursing concerns, observations normal." Lepi says she left the unit at one point to get donor milk for the babies. Lepi is shown a series of text messages between herself and the doctor prior to 9:30 a.m. Lepi expresses disappointment in the message that the doctor will not be on the unit. Quote, "Boo." Lepi says she got on well with the doctor. Lepi asks if the doctor would be on the unit in the afternoon in the message. She adds, quote, "My student is glued to me." She adds, quote, Bit rubbish that you couldn't stay on NNU. Mr. Johnson asks if Letby was missing him. Letby replies this was her first day back from her Ibiza holiday. Letby sent a message at 9:55 a.m. Quote: I lost my handover sheet. Found it in the donor milk fridge. Clearly, I should still be in Ibiza. Letby is asked if it was a busy morning for her. She says reasonably, not exceptionally. Letby is asked how she finds the time to text when at work. She says she would not use her phone at the cot side or a clinical area, but would use her phone elsewhere on the unit. A feeding chart for Childo is shown to the court. Let B is recorded as signing for feeds at 10:30 a.m. and 12:30 p.m. She says the writing above is not by her, but by Rebecca Morgan. She says if she is signed, then Rebecca would not need to. Let B denies feeding and overfeeding Child O. Nurse Melanie Taylor at about 1 p.m. entered room two and said, quote, "He doesn't look as well now as he did earlier. Do you think we should move him back to room one to be safe?" Let B declined. She said she doesn't remember being very dismissive. Melanie Taylor had told the jury she felt Let B was quote undermining her authority. Let B replies, "That's Mel's opinion." She adds that Melanie Taylor had the right to override that and take Child O off her. Let be denied she had sabotaged Child O, or that this would have meant Child O would have escaped her influence. Nicholas Johnson, you'd sabotaged Baby O, hadn't you? And that's why you didn't want him moving out of your control to Nursery One. Let be replies, no. Nicholas Johnson, this would have meant Baby O escaping your influence, wouldn't it? Let be replies, I disagree. Nicholas Johnson K.C. suggests that Lucy Letby made false entries on a nursing chart to show that Baby O was given some ventilation known as CPAP. He says the baby didn't receive this. Nicholas Johnson, you were covering for air you'd given him, weren't you? Letby replies, no. An X-ray report for Child O is shown to the court, including quote moderate gaseous distension of bowel loops throughout the abdomen. Letby is asked why she wrote CPAP in her notes. Letby replies, "I can't answer that now. I don't know." Letby says she does not know if Child O might have been on some CPAP pressure via Optiflow. Letby is asked about messages exchanged between her and a doctor when at 2:30 p.m. she was recorded as taking observations for Child O. The messages were sent at 2:20 and 2:23 p.m. Child O collapsed shortly after 2:40. In her defence statement, she said the doctor colleague was on the unit at the time. Swipe data shows Letby has arrived on the neonatal unit from the labour ward at 2:39. Letby says she cannot say definitively where she was at the time. 
She denies nipping out of the neonatal unit to make it look like she was elsewhere at the time of Childo's collapse. The doctor's note is shown to the court. Quote, Call to see child O at 1440. Desaturation, bradycardia and mottled. Lebby says she believes she called the doctor to the nursery room. She denies it was to get personal attention. Lebby says it was because he was there to assist child O. Lebby says a 20ml saline bolus was given to child O in response to a poor blood gas record. She says there was a delay as there was an issue with getting the line for child O. She says she believes the bolus, which has a time started of 1440, was in response to child O's collapse. A doctor's note recorded for the 1440 collapse states, 10 mil 0.9% sodium chloride bolus already given. Letby agrees the two desaturations for child O that day were profound ones. Letby's note adds, approximately 1440, child O had a profound desaturation to 30, followed by bradycardia, mottled plus plus, and abdomen red and distended. Transferred to nursery one and neopuff ventilation commenced. Perfusion, poor. Let's be when questioned, says babies would frequently desaturate to this level, and this happened prior to June 2015 and often. Let be says the redness to the abdomen on child O was abnormal, and the description of mottling was normal. Mr Johnson says during the intubation, Dr Stephen Breary, in evidence on March 15th, said child O had a rash on his chest, on the right-hand side about 1-2cm to two centimeters in size. He said it was an unusual rash that was initially purpuric and it later disappeared. Letby says, quote, I don't believe that's what I saw. I saw mottling. If that's what Dr Breary saw, then if that's what you could take as being true, then yes. Mr Johnson says when the doctor went to see Chaldo's parents and during that time, Chaldo desaturated again for the final time. Letby says she does not remember this declining moment, but said she put out a crash call. Quote, I remember the death, but not this precise moment where he declined and I put out a crash call. Chaldo was intubated and efforts were made to resuscitate him. Letby says she did not recall seeing the rash disappear. She says she did not see what Dr. Breary and Dr. Ravi Jayram had seen. Letby says she did not pull an NG tube out of Child O's stomach. An X-ray report for Child O is made at 4.46 p.m. It records, quote, NG tube in situ with its tip close to the cardia. This should be advanced by 10 to 15 mil. An earlier X-ray report said the NG tube was, quote, in a good position. Letby says a dislodged tube would still drain as it would still be in the stomach. Letby says the tube could be moved during the intubation process at 2.40 p.m. Mr Johnson says Chaldo's mother, in agreed evidence, said her baby was, quote, changing colour with prominent veins. She says she later saw that in Child P. Letby says she didn't see that herself. The father of Child O said, quote, you could see his different veins. It looked like he had prickly heat, like something oozing through his veins. Letby says she did not see anything like that. She accepts she saw a red, purpley, blotchy rash and a red abdomen. In police interview, Letby said she believed she had done chest compressions and drew up some drugs. Letby says after looking at records, she now believes she was just involved in medications. Mr Johnson suggests Letby is distancing herself from the CPR so it could not be said she caused the liver injury to child O. Letby denies this. Letby says she does not know how child O got the liver injury. Letby denies injecting air into child O to cause an air embolus or inflicting a liver injury on him. Nicholas Johnson. These things all happened on your watch, didn't they? Letby replies, yes. Letby says she disputes an account that Dr. Breary told her not to come in after that shift. Nicholas Johnson. Were you bothered by what you'd witnessed? Letby replies, of course I was bothered. Messages are shown between Letby and the doctor from 9.14pm on June 23rd. Doctor, quote, Your notes must have taken a long time. Had you documented anything from this morning? Letby replies, Only a little. Had the other two to write on as well, and sorting out the FFP, etc. Left signing for drugs until tomorrow. A nurse also messaged Letby, quote, F in hell, what happened? Letby replies, Can't think straight, so took a while. 
blew up abdomen, think it's sepsis. Had big tummy overnight, but just ballooned after lunch and went from there. Letby tells the court that is what she said, having been reviewed by a doctor and that child O had a loopy bowel. She says she is referring to the stention found prior to 8am. Lucy let be at 9.33pm, quote, Worry as identical. Mr Johnson. Were you setting up a false narrative here? Letby replies, No, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. You had already set your plan in motion by pumping air into child P before you left. Letby replies, No. Letby is asked to look at a Datix form she had written. This is a form used by staff when issues have been highlighted, such as clinical incidents. The form said, quote, Infant had a sudden acute collapse requiring resuscitation, peripheral access lost. Dr. Breary said the information in the form was untrue, and he said he didn't believe at any point IV access was lost. Asked about this, Letby says, quote, Well, that's Dr. Breary's opinion. The form adds, quote, S.B. Breary wishes amendment to incident form. Patient did not lose peripheral access. Intraosseous access required for blood samples only. Letby says she does not believe her Datix report was untrue at the time. Nicholas Johnson. You were worried that they were onto you, weren't you? Letby replies, no. Mr. Johnson turns to the case of child P, triplet brother of child O. Let B in her defence statement denies hurting child P. She said she did not recall having an argument with nursing colleague Catherine Percival Ward about working in room one. She said she was in conversation with student nurse Rebecca Morgan when child P collapsed. She said it was, quote, chaotic with all the staff arriving to resuscitate and child P was too poorly to be transferred to room one, so was kept in room two. Child P's stomach was, quote, red. She says at some stage she pricked herself with a cannula needle and needed to go to A&E for treatment. While there, she said she fainted, she believed due to stress and the fact she hadn't eaten. She said she had forgotten she had taken a handover sheet home with her. An examination of child P at 10am on June 23, 2016 was, quote, unremarkable, the court hears. Let B accepts that. She adds there was nothing of note during that day. Mr Johnson suggests child P worsened after child O passed away. Let B agrees. A 6pm feed for child P is signed by Let B and she says the writing above is not by her. Dr John Gibbs had reported in his 6pm review for child P that the baby boy was doing well. A blood sample taken at 6.35pm taken to a lab showed no signs of infection. Let me denies overfeeding child P at some point between 5 and 8 p.m. on June 23rd. Let me agrees there were no problems at the time of the handover for child P on the night of June 23rd. She recalls the x-ray taken shortly after that handover. The x-ray report said, NG tube in satisfactory position, gas-filled bowel loops throughout the abdomen, through to lower rectum with no evidence of obstruction and no plain film signs of perforation. Let me denies pumping child P with air. She agrees this was a deterioration for child P. Medical expert witness Dr Owen Arthurs had previously told the court this image was quite unusual for a baby of that gestation. Let me says she cannot comment how the gas got there, only that she did not put it there. A 14 mil aspirate is recorded for child P at the time of the handover at 8pm. Nicholas Johnson. That was your doing, wasn't it? Letby replies, no. On your way home, you were sowing the seeds of your colleagues. Mr Johnson refers to the quote, worry as identical text message Letby had sent. You were feeding a false narrative, trying to divert attention away from your homicidal activities. Letby replies, no. 5 ml of air and 2 ml of milk is aspirated from child P at 7am. Mr Johnson asks, how much milk had child P been fed overnight? Let me said child P had been fed prior to midnight. She says if the NG tube is in the stomach, air would come out. Let me disagrees that child P was well at the morning handover time, as child P was nil by mouth. However, in a police interview, Let me had earlier said, Child P was stable and well. 
Mr Johnson suggests Letby is deliberately making the appearance of Charles P being worse now than at the time she gave her police interview. Letby responds, no. The day shift for June 24th is shown to the court. Student nurse Rebecca Morgan is on the rotor. Lucy Letby is the designated nurse for Charles P in room 2. The other surviving triplet is also in room 2 with the designated nurse Christopher Booth. Child Q is in room 1 with two other babies. Three babies are in room 3 and three babies are in room 4. Letby rules out staffing levels as a contributory factor in Child P's collapse and death. She also rules out staffing mistakes. She says there were some issues with the chest drain but cannot say how much of an effect that had on Child P. By 6.39am, Sophie Ellis' nursing note recorded that Abdo has been soft and non-distended. 25 mil of air aspirated by SNP Kate Ward. NGT placed on free drainage. Mr Johnson says Letby created a false nursing note at 8am to say, quote, Abdomen full, loops visible, soft to touch. He says that is not the picture from 6.39am. Letby agrees that is not the same as Sophie Ellis's note. Sophie Ellis's note for June 23rd for child O states, Abdo looks full, slightly loopy, abdo soft. Letby says her observation for child P that morning was what she saw. She informed a doctor an hour later about the abdomen observation. She denies a suggestion by Mr Johnson that she is lying. Letby says she escalated the observation to the shift leader. Mr Johnson asks if Letby knew what she was telling her friend, the doctor, at this point. Letby does not recall. The message shown to the court sent at 8.04am, quote, I've got child and child P. Child P has stopped feeds and large asps. Mr Johnson asks why Letby is lying about having the first child, whose designated nurse was Christopher Booth. Letby says she would have to check the paperwork as she may have been assisting. Letby's follow-up message at 8.19am, quote, I'm okay, just don't want to be here really, hoping I may get the new admissions. Mr Johnson asks why Letby didn't raise it with the doctor colleague who was coming into work. Letby says the doctor was not present in a neonatal unit that day. He went to the children's ward. Letby denies the observation was a fabrication as Dr Anthony Yuko saw the loops as well. She said the context of, quote, don't want to be here really, was what she had seen earlier with child O. Mr Johnson refers to Dr Yuko's note of observation at 9.35am, quote, abdomen moderately distended, bloated, soft. Mr Johnson says there is no mention of loopy bowels. Letby replies, no. Letby says Dr Yuko might not have recorded it, Nicholas Johnson, or you have misrecorded it. Letby replies, no. Within a few minutes of Dr Yuko reviewing Child P, Child P collapsed. Nicholas Johnson. That has to be your doing, doesn't it? Letby responds, no. Mr Johnson says Rebecca Morgan's evidence was that Letby had left the room at the time of the collapse. Letby says from her recollection she was in the room and is quite clear on that. Letby's note for the desaturation, quote, Child P had an apnea, brady, desat with mottled appearance requiring facial oxygen and neopuff for approximately one minute, abdomen becoming distended. Mr Johnson says the note is deliberately written to make it look like the neopuffing made the abdomen become more distended. Dr Yuko, the court is told, gave evidence to say Child P was in a very different condition between 9.35 and 9.40am. He also said Letby was very keen for the doctor colleague to be called. Letby says this was because he had been present for Child O's deterioration. She adds it was one of the other doctors who suggested getting that doctor, Nicholas Johnson. Were you trying to attract the doctor's attention? Letby replies, no. Did you enjoy being in these crisis situations with the doctor? No, the doctor colleague and I were friends. Was it something to share between you? Letby responds, no. Child P desaturated again at 11.30am. He was given adrenaline and he was paralysed with a drug to aid ventilation as he had been fighting the ventilator with his breathing. A note in Letby's handwriting is shown to the court. It details the efforts to resuscitate Child P. 
It was found at her home. Lucy Letby. I collect paper and that's where it ended up. I have difficulty with throwing anything away, particularly paper. Is there anything comforting in keeping the paper? Letby responds, I keep paper, yes, from a variety of different sources. Letby clarifies she does not include bank statements in that. Letby was recorded by a nursing colleague as saying for child P, quote, he's not leaving here alive, is he? Letby disputes that, quote, I don't recall the conversation. Child P's final collapse happened at 3.14pm, just after doctors had reviewed him. Letby says she cannot recall shouting for help and cannot recall Child P's breathing tube being dislodged. Nicholas Johnson. The problem happened just after everybody left, just after you had said he's not leaving here alive, is he? Letby replies, I don't agree I said that. Is this another case of bad luck, that it happened just after everybody left? Letby replies, yes. Did you enjoy making predictions when you knew what was going to happen? Letby replies, no. You were very excited in the aftermath of Child P's death. Letby responds, no, I was not. Mr Johnson says a female doctor colleague had said she acted in a totally inappropriate way. Letby replies, no, I didn't. Letby says she told colleague Sophie Ellis out of respect what had happened. Mr Johnson said Sophie Ellis had been to the races. Why not leave her alone? Letby said Sophie Ellis had texted her first. Nicholas Johnson. Did you enjoy the drama? Letby replies, no. Your portent of doom had fulfilled itself, hadn't it? Letby replies, no. At your hand? Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson now turns to the case of Child Q. Letby in her defence statement said she cannot recall much from the shift given what had happened in the previous days. She said she did not understand why feeding was continued for Child Q when it was not being digested. Letby said Child Q was sick and when she arrived from the records, she aspirated, quote, air plus 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 from Child Q. She says she does not know how the air got there and she did not cause it. Child Q was not put on a ventilator as there were concerns over NEC. She did not deliberately retain a handover sheet for Child Q. Mr Johnson says Child Q was transferred to Nursery Room 1. Nicholas Johnson. He was in a serious condition after that, wasn't he? Letby replies, no, I disagree. He needed one-to-one -one care, didn't he? Letby replies, yes, he was assessed ITU care. The rota for June 25th, 2016 at the beginning of the shift is shown to the court. Child Q was in room 2, designated nurse Lucy Letby. One other baby is in room 2 with a different designated nurse. Letby was a designated nurse for a baby in room 1. Two other babies are in room 1 also. Three babies were in room 3 and four babies in room 4. Nurse Mary Griffith had designated babies in rooms 2, 3 and 4. Let's be rules out staffing levels or staffing mistakes or medical incompetence as contributory factors for Child Q's collapse. Let be agrees Child Q required some breathing support at birth. She also agrees Child Q made good progress after birth, according to Mr. Johnson. Let be says, quote, other than some temperature issues, the overall condition of Child Q was positive. Child Q was looked after by Samantha O'Brien on the night of June 24th, 25th, and Child Q was being fed 0.5 ml of milk every two hours at 3, 5 and 7 a.m. A blood gas reading at 6.58 a.m. was, quote, very good. Letby adds, there had been a slight increase in the lactate and the pH reading was slightly lower, but accepts it was a good reading overall. Letby said at the time of Child Q's handover on the morning of June 25th, there were concerns for his abdomen and his feeds. Asked who else had raised these concerns but her, Letby replies, she doesn't know. Letby had previously told her defence that due to temperature concerns and aspirates, she wanted Child Q to be reviewed by doctors before feeding at 9am on June 25th. The neonatal schedule shows Letby made observations for the designated baby in room 1 at 8.30am. She also co-signed for medication at 8.32 to 8.34 for a baby in room 3. At 9am, Mary Griffiths is doing observations for a baby in room 2. 
An unsigned entry is made for Let's Be's designated baby in room 1 at this time. Also at this time, Let's Be is recorded doing observations for child Q. Let's Be says she does not recall doing the observations or being interrupted. Mr Johnson says he uses the word interrupted as swipe data shows Mary Griffith entering the neonatal unit at 9.01am. He suggests Let's Be pump child Q with some clear liquid while Mary Griffiths was out. Let's Be denies this. Let Be is asked why she has only done half a job for the 9am June 25th observation for child Q. Let Be replies, I can't explain why I haven't filled the saturations. You were interrupted by Mary Griffith, weren't you? Let Be replies, No, I don't know why those weren't filled in. Let Be said she left room 2 to go to room 1 as she needed to attend to cares for the other designated baby just after 9am. Mr Johnson says that is a lie. Let Be says the baby didn't need a nappy change but that baby was an intensive care baby who needed regular attention. Let Be agree she had not filled in the saturation readings but otherwise the job was done for Child Q's 9am observation. Let Be says she was not present in the room at the time Child Q vomited. She says she cannot recall aspirating air from the NG tube afterwards but may have done so. Let Be's nursing note states, Mottled plus plus, neopuff and suction applied, air plus plus aspirated from NG tube. Let Be says that information may have been relayed to her. She says the air in child Q might have come from the neopuffing process. Let Be agrees it could be dangerous if the neopuffing and suction was done if there was clear liquid in child Q's system. Let Be said child Q had vomited over his bedding. Child Q in a doctor's notes had quote just vomited and his oxygen saturation dropped to the low 60s. Nicholas Johnson. There was a concern that child Q had inhaled some liquid, wasn't there? Let me replies that is a concern any time a baby vomits. The doctor's observations for child Q continue for 53 minutes. Nicholas Johnson. This was no everyday minor desaturation, was it? Let me replies it was not serious enough to require an emergency crash call. Nicholas Johnson replies, you pumped him with a clear liquid, didn't you? Let me responds, no. Messages sent to a nursing colleague from 1.13pm are shown to the court. Quote, Child Q on CPAP. Mina has taken other baby off me, so just got him. Almost had a tube earlier, but gas is improving. Let me denies the event was trivial, saying Child Q had deteriorated, but it was not on the same level as the other events that have been discussed, and did not need a crash call or resuscitation efforts. Nurse Amy Davies recorded on June 25th, 2016, for the night shift that Child Q had, quote, settled. Nicholas Johnson. He became much better, hadn't he? Let be agrees. A child that was put in your hands in good condition left your hands in a ventilator in intensive care, but by this time was returning to normality. Let be says by the night shift, child Q was still on a ventilator and had a poor blood gas record at 6.23 pm. You had nearly killed him, hadn't you? No, I hadn't nearly killed him. Let me says she was later concerned she was being blamed for something that did not happen by leaving the nursery room unattended. Nicholas Johnson. The truth is that you pumped him, child Q, with liquid and air. Let me replies, no, because you tried to kill him. Let me replies, no, I didn't. Nicholas Johnson KC, on behalf of the prosecution, will now conclude his cross-examination now that each child has been dealt with. He said he's going to start with the text messages sent by Miss Letby after her removal from the neonatal unit. He will then move on to the gang of four doctors who she has claimed concocted the accusations against her. He will then move on to her searches for parents on Facebook, the circumstances in which she said she was isolated from friends, and finally her arrest. Mr Johnson is asking Letby about June 27, 2016. This followed the collapse of her final alleged victim, Child Q, on June 25th. She was told by the manager of the unit not to come in for her shift. In messages from the time, she tells colleagues she is, quote, panicked. Nicholas Johnson. You knew that they were on to you, didn't you? Letby replies, no. 
Letby had messaged a doctor, quote, I can't talk about this now. She writes 12 minutes later, Sorry, that was rude. Felt completely overwhelmed and panicked for a minute. We all worked tirelessly and did everything possible. I don't see how anyone can question that. I'm having a meltdown, plus plus, but think that's what I need to do. Letby says she was having a, quote, dramatic meltdown. A message on Letby's phone at 11.29pm included, quote, Def Datix times 2. Datix no bicarb delay in IO access. Sign out FFP on Meditech and Pink Chart. Child O chart observations. Fluids in Sluis. Sign drugs. Sign Curosoft out. Traffic light drug compatibility. Letby said this was documents she had not yet completed for babies she had cared for. Mr Johnson pulls up a Datix form that Miss Letby recorded on the 30th of June 2016. On this form, she noted that a bung was open on one of the lines for a child. This is a child who is not part of this case. She said in a message to a colleague on the 5th of July that this could have caused an air embolism. Mr Johnson says to Letby that after she was told not to come on shift on June 27th, she had her thinking cap on. She responds... No, that's what I found with this baby and felt it needed to be documented. Nicholas Johnson. You removed the port and covered it as a clinical incident, didn't you? Letby replies, no. This is an insurance policy, so you could show the hospital was so lax. Letby responds, no. It was to cover for accidental air embolus. Letby replies, no. Letby is asked about the investigation and Letby being seconded to an office-based role. Letby messaged, quote, Hoping to get as much info together as possible. If they have nothing or minimal on me, they'll look silly, not me. Did you think attack was the best form of defence? Letby replies, No, this was me responding to what was happening to me. The court is then shown a message from Lucy Letby regarding her union representative and the investigation process. This was made on August 8th, and it states the following. Tony phone, he's going to speak to Karen and insist on the review being no later than first week of September, but said he definitely wouldn't advise pushing to get back on the unit until it's taken place. Asked about social things, and he said it's up to me, but would advise against speaking with anyone in case any of them are involved with the review process. Thinks I should keep my head down and ride it out and can take further once over. Feel a bit like I'm being shoved in a corner and forgotten about by the trust. It's my life and career. Letby said she was feeling isolated and not able to speak to anybody on the unit. Mr Johnson asked if that was really the case. Letby said she spoke to some friends who she was allowed to speak to about the details of the investigation. They were two nursing colleagues and a doctor. Letby's message, quote, It's making me feel I should hide away by not speaking to anyone and going on for months, etc., I haven't done anything wrong. Nicholas Johnson. You knew at this stage you were being blamed for the collapses and deaths of these children. Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson now asks about the gang of four consultants who Lucy Letby claimed were out to get her. Letby had previously said the four were Dr Ravi Jayram, Dr John Gibbs, Dr Stephen Breary and one other doctor who had appointed blame to her to cover failings at the hospital. Mr Johnson says he will go through the cases individually. He says for child A, staffing levels were a shortcoming in administering a long line. For child B, he said there was nothing. For child C, there was nothing. For child D, the antibiotics being delayed may have had an impact on her, but other than that, there was nothing. For child E, the delay in giving him a blood transfusion. For child F, there was nothing. For child G, possibly the colleague had overfed the baby, but that was later retracted. Other than that, there was nothing. For child H, the location of the chest drains may have had an influence. Other than that, there was nothing. For child I, Ashley Hudson should have put her on a monitor and that potentially Dr Chang being called away was a factor. Other than that, there was nothing. For child J, there was nothing. For child K, there was nothing, other than the ET tube may not have been secured. For child L, 
there was nothing. For child M, there was nothing. For child N, there was nothing other than it was busy. For child O, concerns raised by Sophie Ellis were dealt with on the charts. Other than that, there was nothing. For child P, an issue with a chest drain. And for child Q, there was nothing. Mr Johnson says Letby has failed to identify, specifically, an issue with staffing levels for each of these individual cases. Letby says it was raised at times on the unit in relation to the overall care for babies. Mr Johnson says the point of this case is to determine sabotage for the babies or naturally occurring deficiencies. He says Letby cannot give specifics. Letby responds, no. Mr Johnson refers to, quote, suboptimal care for the babies from Letby's defence statement. You are raising the point, aren't you? Letby replies, yes, and you have been given an opportunity to speak about it. Mr Johnson now turns to the Facebook searches let be made for parents of children in the indictment. Free searches are made for parents in quick succession. Mr Johnson asks what the link is. Letby replies, they are babies that have died and been seriously unwell. Letby is asked about another series of searches for free parents' names. Letby replies, they are babies that had something significant happen to them and they were on my mind. Letby is asked why she didn't give that answer to the police. Letby replies, because I couldn't recall why I'd looked at some of them. Is that a true answer? Letby replies, yes. You were checking up on your victims. Letby responds, no, I look at a variety of parents. You were a killer who was looking at your victims, weren't you? Letby replies, no. Mr Johnson asks about a series of other searches and says one of the parents' names has an unusual spelling. Letby is asked to spell that name out to the court. She does so incorrectly. Nicholas Johnson. You read it off a handover sheet, didn't you? Letby replies, no. Letby is asked about another series of searches, to which Letby replies, they were on my mind at the time. One search was made on Christmas Day for the mother of child E and child F, Nicholas Johnson. She was the person who caught you in the act. Letby replies, no, mother of child E and child F I had a good relationship with at the time. Mr Johnson says Letby had given evidence surrounding her suspension from the unit in her first day of giving evidence to the defence. She had said she felt very isolated from my friends and family on the unit, and her mental health had deteriorated. She said, quote, We were a very supportive unit. Regardless of whether we were personal friends, we were a supportive unit. At the time, the hospital advised me not to contact anyone on the unit. There were two or three friends I could contact, but not to contact anyone on the unit. Letby is asked if that was true, and she abided by that. She replied, yes. Letby adds that did change as time went on. Letby has a document which she received from the prosecution this morning regarding her social life. Mr Johnson says it, quote, disproves everything that Letby had said. Letby disagrees. You were telling the jury a sob story, that you had been cut off from your family, as you called them, on the unit. Letby disagrees. Were you looking for sympathy? Letby replies, yes, it was a very difficult time. Was it just a mistake? Letby replies, yes. The document includes photos of Letby's nights out and days out with colleagues. They include a trip to London with a male doctor, which Letby said only happened once. A social timeline is shown to the court, detailing meetings with the doctor in Hartford, Cheshire Oaks twice, and London between May and June 2017. Lucy Letby said in a message, quote, I'm near the park next to where you are. Let me know when you are finishing up and I'll see you outside. Doctor replies, OK, will do. See you soon. Heart emoji. Lucy Letby, smiley face, heart emoji. Letby denies the doctor was her boyfriend. Letby agrees she had a very, very active social life. Letby says a future date on the Facebook diary for September 2017 was listed as a trip to London, but it had to cancel as the doctor had a medical appointment. She denies again he was her boyfriend. Nicholas Johnson. 
You have deliberately misled the jury about this background. Letby replies, no. You have also deliberately misled them about the circumstances of your arrest, haven't you? Letby replies, no. Letby says the police knocked on her door at 6am when they arrested her. She says she thought she had a nightie and a tracksuit and trainers. Mr Johnson says Letby was taken away in a blue Lee Cooper leisure suit. Letby says she is not sure. Mr Johnson says video footage can be played of her arrest. Letby agrees she was taken away in that leisure suit. For the 2019 arrest, Letby agrees she was not taken away in her pyjamas. So why did you lie to the jury about this? Letby replies, I don't know. Letby says it was the first arrest when she was taken away in her pyjamas. Nicholas Johnson. Do you want to watch the video? Letby does not respond. You are a very calculating woman, aren't you, Lucy Letby? Letby replies, no. You tell lies deliberately. And the reason you tell lies is to get sympathy and attention from people. Mr Johnson says Letby was killing children to get attention. Letby replies, I didn't kill the children. You're getting quite a lot of attention now, aren't you? One of Letby's handwritten notes is shown to the court. It is the one which includes a draft sympathy message for child O, child P and another triplet. Mr Johnson asks why a sympathy message has included the name of the surviving triplet as well as the names of child O and child P. Nicholas Johnson. Was that your objective? To kill all three? Letby replies, no. Did that excite you? Letby replies, absolutely not. The quote, I am evil, I did this, end quote, handwritten note by Letby is shown to the court. Letby is asked about the notes. Nicholas Johnson. You had done nothing wrong? Letby replies, no. Why did you think you would not marry and have a family? Letby replies, because I was in the position that I was in and didn't think it would end. You had a good job working in the patient safety department at the Countess of Chester? Letby replies, well that wasn't my choice. It was still a good job. Letby replies, good as in enjoyable. It was secure, with a secure employer. Letby replies, yes. Pays well? Yes, but not as much as nursing, but yes. Letby said there were times when she had good times during the time that she was under investigation. Mr Johnson says this includes drinking fizz and days at the races. Mr Johnson concludes with, You are a murderer. Letby replies, I have not murdered or harmed any child. 